One day, a tall dark tower with many floors appeared in the very center of the city. She broke through the ground with a roar, towered majestically into the heavens, terrifying everything around with her dark aura. It was the end of the world. The people of the city gathered near the televisions and watched as the worried presenter, with obvious fear in her voice, told about the misfortune that had befallen their city. While people were calling what was happening an apocalypse and a catastrophe, the tower appealed to them. A new message came to people, which said that if people want to prevent the fall of humanity, then let them respond to the call of the tower. Those who had the power and deserved to resist the tower responded to her call. Armed to the teeth, people who sincerely wanted to save their world, enthusiastically shouted that it was in the name of humanity. Such people who decided to become defenders were called the wanderers of the tower. The floors of the tower were filled with crowds of various scary monsters. Their eyes were filled with bloodlust, which did not subside, but only grew each time. They attacked the wanderer of the tower in droves, who easily chopped them into pieces, moving up the floors. A certain object appeared in front of the conquerors of the tower a blue and shiny stone. It was a revolving stone that allows the user to reverse time and return to the moment of summoning to the tower. The stone saved the user's memory. Also, it could be divided into parts and used separately. One of the wanderers of the tower took it from his hand and unshakably said that he would use it and then tell everything. In the name of use, the stone shone very brightly, illuminating the entire floor with light. The light was so bright that the others turned away, closing their eyes. When they opened their eyes, they realized that the user of the revolving stone had simply disappeared. At first, people had only two choices, to rise or die, but now, there was a chance to return. Many wanderers of the tower, realizing that they would not be able to contain such hordes of monsters, shouted that they had no choice and used a revolving stone. Many wanderers decided to return. The two wanderers of the tower stood and tried hard to rest. They hoped that these monsters were the last. Returning to the past allowed us to compensate for failures and mistakes. On one of the floors there was a huge scary monster spewing liquid magma from its huge mouth. The wanderer struck a blow, after which, wearily leaned on the sword. He turned his head back and heavily told his friend, Yangwen, that he needed to move on. He saw Yangwen sitting at the floor support with a revolving stone in his hand. The wanderer approached his friend and angrily said that did he also decide to leave. Yangwen raised his head and looked at his friend, smiling, he apologized to him. The remaining wanderer of the tower alone was called Chavin. Chavin could not understand what would happen to the real world that the others had left. Opening the gates of the next floor, from which a wild cold and death immediately blew, he firmly decided that he would not return to the past. A huge ice dragon and a creepy voice admitted that Chavin is an outstanding person, because for the entire time of the tower's existence, no one has dared to climb to the 99th floor alone. Chavin grabbed his sword. He promised himself that, remaining in the present, he would continue to rise. Someone was sitting behind the monitor, which showed everything that was happening in the tower. This someone rather exhaled and, spreading out in a toothy smile, said that this time it would be possible to harvest a rich harvest. Chapter 1 It was a calm early day outside. Birds were singing and sitting on the wires of high-voltage power lines. Shaven, who is in the grocery store, reached for one of the packs of chips. On the TV, weighing in the store, it was reported that lately, because of the yellow dust, it is difficult to see a clear sky. The pack of chips that Chavin took turned out to be full of holes and its contents fell to the floor. Chavin exclaimed in surprise, thinking that it was just a marriage. His little sister, who looked out from behind the shelf, was shocked. The little sister asked in distress if her brother was a thief and was trying to eat chips unnoticed. These, by the way, were her favorite chips. Chavin briefly replied that he did not, and began to collect what had fallen out. The news kept saying that today is not the best weather for a walk. Suddenly, the TV presenter began to say loudly that an earthquake had been recorded in the vicinity of Seoul, while the magnitude was small and there were no casualties. But monitoring agencies reported that the magnitude was increasing and asked to take countermeasures in advance. The chips that fell to the floor jumped noticeably on the spot. People started shouting on the street, pointing their fingers and filming something happening on their phones. The noise that filled the streets drowned out the news broadcast on TV. Shaven stared out the window of the store. People gathered in the street shouted. In the center of the street, the ground began to crack. A column of dust rose, and pieces of earth flew in different directions with a roar, knocking people off their feet. A huge dark tower emerged from the ground, gnawing into the sky. Little sister Chavin snuggled up to him, tears welled up in her eyes. Due to the strong rumble and earthquake, the ceilings in the shops crumbled. People who were also in the store said that everything would be fine, because they called an ambulance and she would arrive soon. Chavin covered his sister with himself and hugging her to him, asked if she was all right. She answered with fear in her voice that yes. Looking out from behind Chavin, she asked what was going on there. Looking around, they saw that the buildings and streets were partially destroyed, there was a mess all around. England, Japan. Unidentified objects began to appear all over the world, including Seoul. People called them the Towers of Nightmares and many received a strange message. It said they were being congratulated because they had been chosen by the Wanderer of the Tower. 
The message asked if they were accepting the call. Two buttons were lit next to the text, one accept, the other refuse. Many people pressed the button with interest and without even thinking, agreeing to accept the challenge and becoming wanderers. The message began to glow brightly and they were transported to the first floor of the tower. People who accepted the call and got into the tower received support from the interface system in the form of weapons, armor and gold coins, and became able to acquire skills and items, just like in a computer game. But they quickly realized that it wasn't a game at all. A lot of people got to the initial floor, the walls of which were filled with videos on which the outside world was broadcast. The interface said that soon the influence of the tower will appear in their world. The travelers watching the video looked at the people who were around the tower and wondered how the tower actually looks from the outside. Workers were pulling construction resources and equipment to the tower. One of them suddenly exclaimed, pointing to one of the floors of the tower. The figure of a woman could be seen in the window of the floor. The workers were surprised how the man got there and began shouting that it was dangerous there and they needed to call the police or 119 as soon as possible. But the girl who appeared in the window was a very unusual girl. It was a monster with a toothy and human mouth and long claws, coming out into the light. Her mouth spread in a terrible smile. And when she growled, monsters began to run from behind her with a roar. The attack of monsters from the tower was the very influence reported by the tower interface. A siren wailed in the city, telling the population about the alarm, but the first pillar with microphones suddenly exploded, lighting up the street with fire. Tanks were pulled up to the tower, which opened fire on the monsters, but everything was to no avail. Some monsters, moving quickly, dodged shots, and some, larger and stronger, destroyed military equipment. After a certain period of time, the city looked devastated. There were no lights on the streets, collapsed buildings and a lot of abandoned and destroyed equipment. One third of the population was destroyed by monsters from the towers. The people inside them could only watch powerlessly. A new message appeared in the tower, which again repeated that they had been chosen by the wanderers of the tower and the saviors of humanity. Hope appeared in the hearts of people. They shouted that they needed to get up, because it was written there that they could save the world. The wanderers decided that they would do everything in their power. Those who received special skills became the last hope for humanity. To stop the complete extermination of people, the wanderers went to conquer the tower. Using the equipment and skills that the interface gave out, they engaged monsters in battle. The wanderers ran into a huge stone that blocked the passage. Their opinion was divided. Some believed that it was not so easy for them to get through here, while others did not see the problem and suggested simply splitting a huge stone. One of the wanderers struck a stone with a mace, and it broke, when suddenly something attracted the attention of another. The wanderer pointed out to the commander a piece of stone that had broken off, which shone pleasantly with a blue light. The interface indicated that this is a revolving stone that allows the user to reverse time and return to the moment of summoning to the tower, while the user's memory remains intact and also, it can be divided into fragments and used separately. The wanderers were surprised that it was possible to return to the past. Someone exclaimed that this was some kind of cheating. H. Wang Yincheng. The commander of the tower wanderers interrupted everything and said that he would use the stone and then tell everything. The stone glowed very brightly, forcing the others to squint and turn away. When the light died down, everyone saw that the commander had really disappeared. The wanderers wondered if the commander would be able to return. It was suggested that even though he was in the past, he probably should then return to the present, just like Captain America. Sakamoto, a former scientist, adjusted his glasses and said that this was the way it should be and he had definitely returned to the past of this world, but the time discrepancy led to the fact that we would no longer be able to meet him. Sakamoto explained what was happening based on scientific theories, including the theory of the multiple universe and the theory of parallel universes. He said that the current situation is a state in which the time branches of the universe are divided, which means that at the moment when H. Wang Yincheng went to the past, their world and the world to which he was transported were divided. The travelers were shocked by what they heard from the scientist. Sakamoto continued, saying that one thing they know for sure is that H. Wang Yincheng has gone to the past. But despite this, the present of this world does not change. As far as everyone knows, information about objects has never been false and this stone forks time and returns them to another world. But this is just a hypothesis. Because it is possible that the people who used the stone fall into the same time period. He summed up the monologue by saying that the objects in this tower go beyond their understanding. Meanwhile, in the outside world, the second influence of the tower occurred. The sky rumbled and filled with black thunderclouds, in which lightning flashed all the time. When the clouds hung over the tower, a huge lightning struck directly on its roof. After the lightning strike, many loud footsteps were heard, a new wave of monsters surged out of the tower, surpassing the first in size. Until humanity on earth was destroyed, the wanderers had to make a choice, use the stone and return to the past or stay and die. The wanderers could not contain the monsters that were staying with every minute. The floors were filled with cries of pain and requests for help. The wanderers used the revolving stone because they understood that they had no choice and yet, everything went wrong in their lives anyway. The sword of one of the wanderers broke, and he just stood there in fear. 
before using the stone. His friend apologized to him and said that he saw no other way out. The wanderer fell to his knees, and the monster in front of him growled loudly and wanted to attack. Then a swordsman appeared. With two of his blades, he quickly chopped a huge monster into pieces. Then he ran up to the wanderer and with a kind expression on his face asked if he was alright. Another group of wanderers came. They asked in surprise if everyone had run away. They despised such people. They thanked the only remaining wanderer from the previous group for holding on to the end and not running away. There were people who did not rely on the stone and wanted to protect the present, not the past. It was a suicide squad called Carp Deem, which translated from Latin as Catch the Day, Live in the Present. Chapter 2 The wanderers were scattered on the floor, which was covered with blood. Chavin lay buried in stones and moaned in pain. He could not understand where their mistake was. With pain in his body, he grabbed the hilt of his sword. Yunwen was already flying at a monster hovering in the sky that looked like a witch and shouted for the monster to pay attention to him. Yongwen shouted to Chewen that now was the time. At this time, just at the right moment, the fool, shouting so that his friend would not worry, flew at the monster from behind. Friends shouted that it was time for the monster to die, and struck him from both sides, cutting him into small pieces. After the battle, Chewen asked if there were any dead. Yunwen happily said that fortunately, no, and the wounded will recover after they rest. After looking at their squad, the friends waved to them, and Yongwen said that at this rate they were able to get to the last floor, they happily waved back. Chavin looked thoughtfully at the floor. On the floor he saw the sword of a real dragon. The sword of the owner of the 85th floor, which was forged for 1000 days and nights to slay the dragon, the sword also had the energy of the sun and moon. Chavin approached the sword, picking it up. He began to examine it contentedly, rejoicing that a powerful weapon also fell out quite by the way. Mentally agreeing with Yunwen, Chewen, looking at his new weapon, admitted that perhaps they could really get to the last floor. Chavin, covered in abrasions, said he thought everything would go smoothly. With horror in his eyes, he looked at the terrible monster from the flaming jade room, 98th floor. A huge monster with an open mouth, from which steam was coming out abundantly, which was ready to attack. Seeing all this horror, what the monster did to his squad, and how he destroyed all their powerful weapons in one fell swoop, Chavin could only watch what was happening, unable to move. With one crushing blow, the monster threw the fool into the wall so that a large dent was left on it. Chavin, almost choking on his own blood due to the collision with the wall, began to lose consciousness. His last thoughts were that everything was in vain. Remembering all the good moments with his team, Chavin recalled all the trials that they managed to go through together. He couldn't believe that they had come all this way to die so pitifully in this place. Exhausted and having lost any hope, Chavin looked at the monster, which was preparing to finish him off, releasing lava from its open mouth. When suddenly Yongwen appeared behind the monster, with anger in his eyes, he attacked the monster. Chopping the monster into small pieces, Yongwen tried to shout to Chewen, asking him to wake up. Chewen, not believing his eyes, uttered the name of Yunwen with surprise, while he continued to shred the monster with all the hatred for the killed comrades. Yunwen wanted to say that he couldn't do it alone, when suddenly, the monster pierced him through with its horn. Chewen watched in horror as scarlet and warm blood flowed from his friend's hands while Yunwen was pierced by the monster. Chewen with incredible anger began to shout at his friend, calling him. The monster lifted off the ground with one sharp movement and with a terrible roar tore to the other end of the floor, piercing the wall with its horn. Watching the whole picture, the shocked Chewen with all the anger and hatred clenched his teeth. Gathering his last strength, Chewen picked up his weapon and headed towards the monster, pointing the sword directly in his direction. A strange white light began to appear from the tip of the sword, enveloping the stone next to the monster like a lasso. Surprised by this sight, Chavin asked himself what kind of light it was. But without finishing his thought, he flew towards the monster with incredible confidence in his abilities. Looking at all the devastation that remained after their battle with the monster of this floor, Chavin looked at the already harmless and lifeless body of the monster, from behind whose mouth steam was still coming out. Chavin was trying to catch his breath after a hard battle, greedily gulping air. Exhausted and tired, Chavin called his friend, who was sitting on the ground with his back against the wall. Seeing a serious wound on his friend's arm, Chavin was horrified and was about to say something. Suddenly, Yongwen interrupted him and apologized to him, trying to make it seem that these seconds were the last in his life. Chavin, watching this, remembered his friend, whose smile never disappeared in this cruel and dark tower. It was because of this that the wanderers called him the Smiling Knight. This time the knight lost his smile. Chavin, holding back the pain of losing his friend, began asking him to leave before he changed his mind. Turning around, Chewen started to leave, when suddenly Yongwen, clutching a stone in his hand, spoke. Yongwen was surprised that his friend had noticed. Yunwen realized that it was too late to use this stone. Yunwen knew that Chewen was much stronger than he initially thought, which is why he was confident that he could pass the last floor of the tower alone. Yunwen was glad that there was a person like Chewen in this world. While Yunwen was thinking about it, he had already arrived at the tower window. Sitting on the edge of the window and squeezing his injured hand, Yongwen remembered his friend with a smile. 
He tipped over backwards and flew down, leaving a scarlet trail on the edge of the window. Shaven, having reached the door, almost opened it, but thoughts of a smiling friend did not leave him. Telling himself to go ahead, he pushed open the door to the next floor. A strong and cold wind blew out of the open door. Everything was covered in ice outside the door. These are permafrost lands. Chapter 3 Shaven entered the room. Everything around him was imprisoned in ice. A terrible cold shackled his body. Because of the cold, breathing became heavy, thick steam was coming out of the mouth of the Chavan. The monster guarding this floor opened its huge mouth and prepared to attack. Magic spheres began to fly out of its mouth, which, when they came into contact with the earth, bound it with dense ice. Shaven ran back, dodging the attacks. It was difficult to stand on such a surface, because of the slippery snow and ice. The monster screamed loudly in a nasty voice so that the fool would give up. From his roar, snow and ice particles flew towards Chavin, cold breathed from the monster's mouth, which caused the skin on Chavin's arm to become covered with an ice crust. Smiling, Chavin replied with a grin that how could he, was the monster already tired of him. Suddenly, an explosion thundered in the place where Chavin was standing. The snow rose high. When the snow settled down, Chavin was no longer visible. Chavin was sitting in some kind of cave covered with ice, and behind its transparent walls a monster was visible, who was looking for Chavin with malice in his eyes. Shaven, restraining the pain, was breathing heavily and holding onto his hand, which was frostbitten due to the cold roar of the monster. The ice dragon, continuing to look around, asked in the same nasty voice if Chaven was going to play hide and seek again. Chaven was visibly nervous, sweat was running down his face, which almost immediately froze. It's been ten years since Chaven was able to arrive on the 99th floor. There were a lot of dangers before the 98th floor, too, but what he was facing now couldn't be compared to anything. Shaven opened the vial and began pouring some kind of potion on the wound. Chewen squeezed a piece of cloth in his mouth so as not to cry out in pain and not give away his location. Then, when Chewen joked about the boss of the 99th floor, his name is the Ice Dragon Volkaisos, he apparently got very angry and attacked him with an ice ray. The snow and ice rose due to the effect of the ice armor given to Chewen by Yunwen. Chewen sat and looked at his equipment. He realized that if it were not for the items of other wanderers that he managed to find, he would have been dead long ago. The thought made him sad, but at the same time he was grateful to them. Of the equipment, Chewen had a real dragon sword from the 85th floor, an ice armor that Yunwen gave him and a Fire King bracelet. Looking at the bracelet, he felt very hurt in his soul. He closed his eyes and remembered Han Soil. Chewen is angry with himself, because if he was even a little stronger. He gripped the bracelet tightly and remembered an unpleasant moment from his life. And it was Han Soil, lying in blood on one of the floors of this cursed tower. Then a voice shouted to Chewen, who was urgently calling him. Bad memories and thoughts immediately receded. Chaven, sitting at the table, looked up with interest and apologized for not answering right away. The man who worked on the anvil asked him if he had decided to try again. Chaven quietly agreed and added that this time he would definitely be able to pass. He lifted the mug of drink to his mouth. Atopo's blacksmith Jay exclaimed joyfully. That was good news. The village where Chaven was located was founded after the destruction of the dragon Altaminos, the boss of the 50th floor. Every day there were more and more dead and wounded, but people did not lose hope. The priest organized a rescue group that searched for and rescued the incapacitated, and the blacksmiths of the village, in order to help the wanderers who fought for humanity, repaired their equipment for free. After drinking some of the contents of the mug, Chavin said that now there were no blacksmiths left in the village, except for Jay. Working hard on the sword, Jay replied that there was nothing to be done, and he also had only a fool from his clients. Jay added that materials from the lower floors have stopped arriving recently, although there were supplies of minerals a couple of months ago. Chavin thought grimly that it was all because there were almost no survivors left in this tower. Chavin didn't even know what year it was in their world. Until today, there have been more than ten influences of the tower, and from some point on, new wanderers stopped appearing on the first floor. With sadness in his voice, Chavin said that probably the entire population of the Earth had already died. Jay said nothing and exhaled heavily. Jay didn't say anything for a while and asked if Chen had noticed anything strange while walking around this tower. Chan suddenly remembered that there was a very strange inscription at the spot where the revolving stone was found, which said that the tower was inside the tower, a nightmare within a nightmare. Chan clutched his head, not understanding who had left it and what it even meant, but he told Jay that he hadn't seen anything special. Jay sadly said that yesterday Granny Heron disappeared. Chavin could not believe what he had heard. People don't age in the tower, so someone's disappearance can be explained by two things, either a person went to the past or jumped off the tower. Granny Hiron from Elixir's Hiron and Jay from Jay's workshop were one of the few wanderers of the auxiliary class. Jay continued to work, saddened by the loss of Granny Hiron. Chewen asked Jay to teach him the blacksmith's skill. Jay froze in surprise, and Chewen calmly got up and headed to the workplace with a smile on his face. Later, Chewen returned to the boss of the 99th floor. The ice dragon Volkaisos asked in a nasty voice if Chewen had decided to stop hiding. Volkaisos thoughtfully said that during the entire existence of the tower, 
No one has dared to climb alone to the 99th floor. Valkaizo said he recognizes Chavin because he is an outstanding person. Chavin exhaled with a smile. He could not imagine that the last person to recognize him would not be a man, but a monster. Chavin said that after such flattering words, he was sorry to kill him. Valkaizos replied that he did not want to disappoint Chavan, but he would not succeed. Chavan bared the blade of his sword and defiantly asked if the dragon really thinks so. Chavan took a stand and said in a serious voice that the vaunted armor of the ice dragon began to crumble a little. Valkaizos, hearing the words of Chavan, flew into a rage. He called him a cheeky little man and opened his huge mouth, preparing for an attack. While the dragon was saying that the games were over, Chavan had already jumped towards him with incredible speed. Chapter 4 the attack of the ice ray of the dragon hit the Chavan and he flew violently into the icy rocks. Blood splashed in different directions. Chavan was badly wounded. Velkaizos, looking at Chavan, said in a nasty voice that he saw that he had decided to fight to the end. Velkaizos said that even if Chavan could hold out, he would still not be able to escape from fate and in the end emptiness and loneliness would await him. Ice magic, in the form of the wanderers of the tower, began to bind the body of Chavan with its fetters. Chavan called out to the dragon and panting. Holding back the pain, said that he was talking too much. Chavan cut the ice bonds with his sword and rushed to the attack with rage in his eyes. Belkaizos menacingly told Chavan to stop pretending to be strong and give up, because he would not be able to defeat him with such skills. Chavan started exploring the tower later than other wanderers, and therefore missed his chance to get hidden skills, hidden class and other advantages. Therefore, I decided to abandon the accumulation of various skills and focused only on one thing. On the lunge, lunge after lunge, he practiced this technique. With the help of a lunge, he killed so many monsters that they began to call him that. He could feel the lunge changing him. He became stronger, faster, more accurate. With one lunge, he nailed the opponent through and through. Because of this, the lunge was no longer just a skill. His attack power has reached the level of hidden skills. In addition, so formally, the lunge was not a hidden skill, so he can use it without spending mana. And even so, it was still hard for him. Chewen has hit the dragon so many times, and there are only a couple of scratches on it. Belkaizos opened his mouth to attack. Chavan realized that it would be too late to evade. Then he noticed some strange, hard-to-see light on the dragon's face. He guessed. He had seen such a light on the 98th floor at the Flaming Jade. If it was really him, then. Chavan gripped his sword tightly and took aim, shouting furiously, preparing to attack. Chavan hit the dragon with all his might. The monster's legs gave way. The light intensified. Ice pieces of the dragon's face flew in different directions. Chavan landed on the ground and looked at Belkaizos. Belkaizos shouted furiously that how dare a fool. The dragon was missing one eye. Instead there was a black hole, and the entire left side of the face was terribly disfigured. Chavin grinned and said that this was not enough either, because he planned to chop off his entire jaw. Belkaizos angrily asked if Chavin was so confident in himself, since he had wounded him only once. The dragon flapped its huge wings and took off, saying that it would put an end to this now. He began to attack Chavin with ice rays. Practically without stopping, he barely dodged. Chavin was annoyed that it was an air attack again. Chavan realized that he had no chance of winning, he stumbled and fell to the ground. The dragon landed with a crash right in front of him and said in his menacing and nasty voice that he was sorry. If there were ten of the same heroes here, they would be able to defeat Belkaizos. Hearing the words of the proud monster, who already had half of his jaw missing, Chavan angrily ordered him to shut up, but as if not hearing the hero, the monster continued to speak. Chavan was shocked to hear that if people had not succumbed to the Stone of Nightmares and if there were a dozen more such heroes, they would have easily been able to escape their sad fate. Not believing his ears, Chavan asked what Volkaizos wanted to say, not understanding what this monster meant. Ignoring the guy's question, the monster began to deliver its crushing blows again. Noticing the monster's attack in time, Chavan gathered his strength, jumped away from the monster's paw passing nearby and rushed to the exit. Noticing this, Volkaizos growled, angry that he could not finish off the young man. Greedily sucking in air and restoring strength, Chewin looked at his health scale, which was already at a minimum, he continued to think that if the dragon's claws had reached him, he would have died there for sure. Remembering the words of Velkaizos about the Stone of Nightmares, the guy, covered in sweat and abrasions, began to gradually understand what the monster was talking about. Five years later, this mighty and proud keeper of the floor was crushed, along with the victory over the monster. A large number of notifications began to arrive about the new title, about getting the maximum amount of experience, about getting the maximum level, about physical development and about increasing dexterity. After a flurry of alerts, Chavin sighed wearily and completely without interest, sitting on another defeated enemy. The young man, deciding to find out again about the nightmare stone that was bothering him from the still-living Volkaizos, rudely ordered him to speak. The monster, without giving any specific answer, said that the guy already knows the answer and the whole truth will be revealed on the top floor. With these words of his, he further confused the already incoherent thoughts of Chavan. Chavan was looking at a new artifact. 
It was an ice dragon sword that contained the breath of an ice monster. Shaven received it after defeating Belkaizos. He stared at the artifact with incomprehension, surprised that this weapon looked more like a dagger than a large and dangerous sword. While Chavin was looking at his replenishment in the arsenal, the black liquid on the ice began to stir and boil. Soon it turned into a passage to the long-awaited hundredth and last floor. With complete confidence and determination in his eyes, Chewen headed straight for the aisle. He gradually disappeared into the dark curtain of the newly formed door, leaving behind the ice blocks of the 99th floor. After Chavin entered, the door disappeared without a trace, as if it had never existed. Chapter 5 Sticking his head out of the impenetrable haze of the passage, Chavin began to look around the new floor. He saw a lot of monitors that opened up a view of the entire tower. All the images were familiar to Chavin, such as the summoning room, at office. Then the flow of thoughts of Chavin was interrupted. The voice seemed not to expect to see him so soon and said that he thought he would go to the village first. Not expecting to hear someone, the hero automatically stood up in a stance and prepared to draw his sword, looking cautiously in the direction of the voice. Something from the shadow asked Chavin to wait while it was preparing something and offered him a little rest. While Chavin was perplexed by what was happening, he received a notification congratulating him that he was the first to complete tutorial 294 and that his outstanding achievement would forever be recorded in the Eternal Library. Chavin stood in perplexity. Unable to move, he did not understand what was happening and what kind of tutorial it was. He was thinking about his no longer living comrades. A flood of memories flooded into his head. The voice, seeing his shocked state, spoke again, trying to calm the guy down. The voice asked him not to take everything to heart, otherwise the flow of feelings would drown him. The owner of the voice began to appear from the shadows. It was a strange monster, unlike the others. It can be described as a man with the head of a black lion. He was dressed in a serious suit, and his eyes were burning bright yellow. The monster started talking again about how it was already too late and with self-respect pitied the guy, saying that for a human he did well. But when he saw that the tsunami that began to overwhelm Chavan, he did not care. The monster fell into a stupor. At this time, Chavan was looking at the lion without any interest. The monster was shocked that Chavan had recovered so quickly. The wary Chewin wondered who it was. The monster, remembering that he forgot to introduce himself because of the joy that he had met Chavan, began to fumble and worry. After all, Chavan was the only one who could reach the hundredth floor, and even alone. Finally, the monster introduced himself. This mysterious creature with the head of a lion was a demon named Beastrain. Beastrain was the master of the Tower of Nightmares, which Chavan had just passed. Chavan continued to worry about the fact that if he had just passed the tutorial, then there was a game based on it. Beastrain, with a contented grimace, began to praise the wits of Chavan and wanted to show him something. He clicked his clawed paw and monitors appeared behind the lion on which it was broadcast how Chavin and his former team got into the tower. On the recording, an incomprehensible squad of Chavin was visible. Chavin noticed himself in the crowd of these people. He could hear their conversation about whether Chavin would mind if Soil went with them, because the three of them are much better and safer than the two of them. On other monitors, Chavin saw how he and his team met more and more new people from different places, how they all talked a little about themselves and got acquainted, gathering more and more new comrades. The smug demon, as if mocking the fool, talked about how the guy was probably glad to see the faces of his comrades, whom he would not see again. The monitors began to show sad moments with the loss of each comrade. Suddenly, a black-haired girl with a sword, covered in blood, whose name was Soil, attracted the attention of Chavan. In the video, she asked Chavan with a smile to stop looking at her and start fighting. But immediately after that, they showed footage of her last moments of life, where Chavan held her limp body and tearfully asked her to open her eyes. B-Strain continued to mock, saying that at this point he was crying himself. Another fragment was already showing on the monitor, which showed Yang Wen in his last moments of life asking for forgiveness from Chewen. After watching all the monitors, the demon tried to find out if Chewen remembers the feelings that haunted him as he passed the tower, that sadness, rage and regret. Beastrain, with a snarl on his face, exclaimed that all those feelings he had experienced should stay with him. Only then will he be able to give him a new chance to start this game from the beginning. The demon thought this was a great offer for a fool because in the human world this can only happen in a novel, start all over again, preserving your memories. Chavin could not believe what he had heard. He thought that this was the end and as soon as they passed the tower, the world would be saved. Remembering the first notification I received with congratulations that Chavin was chosen as a wanderer of the tower who can save the world. Chavin realized that it was all a hoax from the very beginning. He thought that it was impossible to stop the influence of the tower. They have been fighting all this time against something that cannot be defeated. The savior of humanity should never have appeared. Throwing back the abyss of thoughts, Chavan, with full determination in his eyes, turned to the demon, saying that Beastrain already knows that the young man is not going to return to the past. Hearing this, the demon laughed nervously, and at the same second, his head grew in size. Opening his fanged mouth, he headed towards the Chavan. Looking at the guy, Beastrain decided to explain everything to him in more detail. 
He said that no object on the whole great earth could send him into the past, because there is no object with such properties. Chavin did not understand what this demon was carrying, because he had seen the stone himself. Before he could think of the sentence, Chavin suddenly remembered the words of the keeper, of the 99th floor, Belkaizos, that if humanity had not succumbed to the deception of the nightmare stone, they would have managed to escape their terrible fate. With horror and realization in his eyes, Chavin remembered about the white stone they had received. Seeing the expression on the guy's face, Beastrain decided to briefly explain everything that all this time, it was not a stone of return, but a stone of nightmares. Everyone who used the stone did not come back, but only got stuck in a terrible nightmare. Before the 77th floor, the demon could not have imagined that there was a race so obsessed with returning to the past, because only humans could be so stubborn. It was clear from the lion's face that he was very amused by everything that was happening. Completely ignoring the Chavin trying to say something, the demon continued to repeat his own. He was sure that Chavin would make the right choice and start the main game. But as soon as an alert icon popped up in front of Chavin and asking if he would go through the game further, the guy immediately pressed the no button. Seeing this, Beastrain's eyes bulged as if he didn't believe what was happening. Chavin began to thank the demon, because thanks to him he understood the essence of this tower. Immediately after that, an alert appeared behind the shocked lion, where information about the subject with the name Tower of Nightmares tutorial was written. Chavin, with full determination in his eyes, reminded the demon that he was already in the nightmare of the tower, which means that if Chavin kills Beastrain, he will move to the next floor. Chapter 6 Chavin firmly grasped the hilt of his sword and slowly pulled it out of its scabbard. He said emphatically that if he killed Beastrain, he would move to the next floor. Beastrain, tired of explaining everything, said that there was no next floor and they were at the top of the tower. Chavin replied that he did not believe a single word. Beastrain asked if Chavin really wanted to get a reward for cleaning the floor and added with a laugh that it was unlikely that the thirst for a reward took hold of him so much. Chavin did not let him finish and with his signature lunge took off Beastrain's head. The monster's head fell at his feet with a thud. Beastrain thoughtfully stretched out that in fact. But then, having changed his mind about talking, he agreed and asked what Chavin wanted, maybe some hidden object or a hidden skill. Beastrain was ready to give Chavin anything he asked for, because he deserved it. Chavin rudely replied to the cut that he didn't need anything. Raising his mangled head, Beastrain asked if Chavin did not want to return home. Beastrain said he thinks that Chavin has already realized that the tower is a complete nightmare, which means that nothing happened outside. Not believing in the words of the monster, Chavin, stammering, asked what it meant. Then he heard a conversation between two girls behind his back, connected with the lateness of one of them. He turned his head in the other direction and saw a group of guys who were talking about tickets. Chavin, not believing his eyes, asked what it was. Beastrain laughed slowly and said that at last Chavin began to understand everything, that no one was killed. Beastrain thoughtfully asked if it wasn't amazing. Keeping into the phone of some person, Beastrain added that for such a brave hero, this should be good news. Beastrain snapped his finger, saying that he almost forgot the most important thing. They moved back to some place. There were voices that said that the patients were still unconscious. Chavin looked around the dark room, in which there were many hospital beds with people. Chavin approached his body, connected to a life support device, and asked if it was really him. Beastrain asked if it wasn't amazing. He also explained that many years had passed in the tower, and only a month had passed in his world. Crossing his arms over his chest, Beastrain haughtily said that Chavin could not win anyway, even though he had passed the entire tutorial, because he was something more. This means that there is a difference between them, like between a man and a dragon. Chavin quietly said that it wasn't so big then, because he had already killed one dragon. Chavin drew his sword and stood in a stance, smiling. Beastrain mockingly said that Chavin is very self-confident, and Chavin has already rushed to the attack. The door creaked open, raking dirt and a layer of dust on the floor. A seriously wounded Chewin, holding bottles of potions in his hands, leaned out from behind the door and panting told Jay that he was here. It was very dirty in the workshop. The corners were overgrown with cobwebs. Chavin hopefully pronounced the name of the blacksmith. Still recovering from a hard battle, Chavin picked up a hammer and began to work hard on his sword. Chavin has been calling Beastrain to fight for 72 days and cannot even strike a single blow. He was glad that, at least, he had not died himself and sincerely did not understand why Beastrain was not going to kill him. Chavin decided that no matter how many days or years it took, Beastrain was sitting in front of the screen on the 100th floor and looking at Chavin, he tightly clenched his fist and told himself to hold on, because Chavin could be sold well. Beastrain called Chavin his special commodity. He thoughtfully raised his hand to his face and said that as a manufacturer, it was the first time he had seen such a person. The manufacturers must ensure that the goods safely take root on the Great Earth thanks to a two-stage processing process. In the first stage, the seeds are sifted out better, it is thanks to the tutorials that you can find a good product. In the main game, the processed seeds will begin to bloom violently. In other words, in the second treatment, our expensive sprouts are provided with water and fertilizer. Beastrain was angry that the seed refused to grow. 
He wondered if he could just be killed, because death in the tower does not mean that his soul will die. For example, after his death in the tower, Yang Wen lives quietly in his own world. Bi Strain became nervous that suddenly after death the seed would deteriorate. After such damage to the goods, the collectors will definitely not get rid of it. B Strain gripped the corner of the chair tightly with his hand and decided that he needed to grow it well and sell it, then he could become a demon of the highest class, and he still had to pay off the debt for the purchase of the tower. B Strain was glad, because even the gods wanted to buy Chaven, even though they don't work with the demon world. Then the portal to the 100th floor opened. A Chaven flew out of it incredibly quickly and attacked a B Strain. B Strain calmly repelled the attack with his magic and asked what Chaven wanted, because he must have some kind of motivation. Shaven kept hitting and hitting, but it was unsuccessful. B Strain again asked if it was time to give up. B Strain tried to persuade him, saying that if Chaven moves into the main game, it will be better for him, then there is no point in resisting. B Strain was angry that Chaven did not respond to his persuasions and snapped his finger and pretended to laugh. After the click, the B Strain disappeared. Chaven was shocked by this. Chaven noticed the presence of the enemy behind his back and quickly turned around to attack. But at that moment, an ice block flew into him with great force. Chaven coughed up blood. B Strain grabbed him by the neck and shouted furiously for Chaven to finally tell him what he wanted. B Strain was willing to give Chaven any hidden skills and hidden objects. He didn't understand why he was doing this nonsense. Chaven calmly replied that he wanted to kill him and move on. B Strain angrily shouted that he was hearing this nonsense again and asked what he needed to do to get Chaven to agree to switch to the main game. Chaven realized that B Strain was caught and he finally ran out of patience. Chaven said that then he would ask him a question. A little later, B Strain sat and told Chaven in a serious tone that he did not want to frighten, but there are many different universes in the world. Chaven and B Strain were sitting across the table from each other. Chaven replied that he knew, because everyone on Earth knows the theory of multi universes and parallel universes. B Strain was very surprised by this. B Strain said that if so, then he would move on to specifics. He began to explain that there is a main dimension called the Great Earth, and there are already many subworlds under it. The Earth, Chavana, is only a subworld existing among the rest and she calls their planet Mir 294. B Strain continued that thanks to the Tower of Nightmares, wanderers upgrade their skills, accumulate items and get used to the system of the Great Earth, getting a chance to go to a new world. Demons like B Strain look after the game and influence its course. Shaven menacingly asked why the demon was doing this. B Strain smiled all over his mouth and said that it was hard to say, and he didn't think it was really interesting for Chavan. B Strain snapped his finger. They found themselves in Seoul in front of the tower. The demon asked if he understood correctly that Chaewen wanted to know why the tower appeared in his world. B Strain kept asking if Chaewen wanted to know why he and his apprenticeship were destined for such a fate. B Strain smiled and said that the land was chosen absolutely by chance, to which Chaewen interrupted him and said that was enough. Chaewen menacingly said that he had asked a question and repeatedly asked why B Strain was running the Tower of Nightmares. This question took the demon by surprise. He asked again uncertainly. Chaven again asked if B-Strain would receive a reward for this. The demon hesitated and lied that it was more like charity. B-Strain pretended to laugh and said that he could see that Chaven did not believe him. He began to try to convince Chaven, saying that in fact demons love charity and some of his friends are just quietly watching the wanderers, and some can interfere and help their pets. Then the B-Strain received a message from the owner, which said that the product was not yet at the stage of maturation, so it could not be killed and negotiated. After reading it, B Strain realized that he had broken the rules. The demon asked Chaven again if he believed him, to which Chaven angrily replied that no. Chapter 7 User Information Name Chaven Level 100 The limit has been reached. Title Conqueror of the 99th Floor Class Swordsman Unique Ability Willpower Status Information Strength 100 The limit has been reached. Dexterity 100 The limit has been reached. Survivability 100 The limit has been reached. Will, 100, the limit is reached. Magic, 100, the limit is reached. Shaven was sitting on the 99th floor in front of the portal to the 100th floor and was considering his characteristics. He was drinking a restorative potion. He has nothing else to raise, but he still fails to win. He collapsed on the snow and exhaled. He suggested that the limit for all people might be the system of this world. Suddenly, he felt a lot of pain. He jumped up and clutched his chest. He could not understand what this strange feeling was. Then he noticed some strange particles that were flying in the air. Chaven thought it was an illusion and grabbed one such piece. They were spinning in the air and looked like pieces of stuck sugar, taking on new and new forms. Then Chaven instinctively realized that they were part of any world. That means it doesn't matter what form they take. Chaven angrily said that volunteering from the mouth of a demon sounds ridiculous. He noticed a message behind B-Strain and asked who the owner was. B-Strain was glad that Chaven finally became interested. He began to explain that the owners are the rulers of the Great Land and the winners of the main game can go there and receive special patronage of the owners. 
Chavan asked what kind of special patronage it was. The demon agreed and said that the future of Chavan will change depending on which patron he chooses. Beastrain hugged Chavan and put a claw to his cheek. The demon said that if he listened to him, then he, Beastrain, could give him the word and choose someone really worthwhile as a patron. But of course, if the fool agreed to participate in the main game. Chavan looked wearily at the demon. Chavan told the demon that he was like a pesky salesman of some company. Beastrain asked with interest why this was so. Chavan, deciding not to answer the demon's question, said that he agreed to do as the demon wanted, but he would leave this place in exactly ten days. Nine days later, Chavan has been training hard to do his signature punch lunch. The demon, who was watching him through the monitor, laughed, saying that Chavan only does what he trains. Beastrain wondered how much Chavan wanted attention. Beastrain couldn't wait to send Chavan to the main game and calmed himself down, saying that there was very little left. He regretted that he had gone along with the nightmares and bought this useless tower. Beastrain got angry and shouted that it was all because of the maintenance workers. He was told that the tower was built by a nightmare master and that this is the oldest building of the first generation of construction. A picture popped up in his head of how the tower salesman was telling him that this was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. If it were a third-generation tower, he would be able to complete the tutorial with his own hands without harming the product in any way. Beastrain imagined how all the wanderers were surprised that there was no opt-out button. In this junk from the first generation, I can't do anything without the consent of Chavan, and Chavan stood his ground and refused, wanting to kill the demon and move to the next floor. Yes, nothing can be done. Poverty is the worst thing that could be thought of. Beastrain exhaled heavily and stretched out on his couch. He was sincerely glad that tomorrow everything would come to an end and he would send Chavan to the main game. Mandatory hints to start the main game. What is the Tree of Illusions, the origin of the root of the Tree of Illusions, the structure of the Tree of Illusions, the food of the Tree of Illusions? A new message came saying that the Game Master wanted to finish the tutorial. The message suggested returning to the world of 294 without memory loss and starting the main game. Under the question of whether the user agrees, two buttons burned brightly, one yes, the other no. Beastrain happily asked if Chaewen had learned everything he had sent him. Chaewen, looking at the message in front of him, replied that, and thanked him. The demon has already endured and asked Chaewen to agree faster. Beastrain began to rub his eyes and happily said that he had been waiting for this for a very long time and from the overflow of feelings he would now start crying. At this moment, the sharp blade of Chavan's sword cuts into the demon's face and blows her to pieces. Beastrain menacingly asked what Chavan was doing, to which he replied that the demon himself understands everything perfectly, saying that right now he was going to kill him, Chavan rushed to attack. After the particles became visible, it became difficult for Chavan to make lunges. While striking, it's as if something stops him, as if a new feeling has awakened inside. Shaven skillfully dodged the demon's blows, striking more and more blows. Successfully conducting strikes, Shaven happily thought that maybe this is the taste of life. But then a magic circle appeared under his feet. Iron stems emerged from the floor and bound the body of Shaven. It was plants of the 91st floor, a forest of black iron, restoring his body. Beastrain angrily said that he really sees someone like Shaven. It would have been much easier for the two of them if he had done so from the very beginning. The demon menacingly asked if Chavan agreed with him. Chavan, bound by iron stalks, asked what Beastrain would do now because he could not finish the game without his consent. Beastrain agreed, but admitted that, to be honest, he no longer expects a voluntary consent from Chavan. This time it was Beastrain who wanted to ask a question. The demon asked how Chavan thinks, why this tutorial keeps going on and on. Beastrain explained that the Mosquito Tower automatically closes the game 100 days after the end of the tutorial. Hearing this, Chavan was shocked. The demon kept saying that now he would just leave him here and he would quietly move into the main game. Shevin gripped the hilt of his sword tightly and said that in the great land of Beastrain they call a flattering gentleman. Hearing such information, the demon's eyes widened in surprise. Shevin went on to say that Beastrain lived 784 years and visited 128 worlds, all the while selecting and killing wanderers. Beastrain angrily asked how Shevin knew all this. Shevin asked if it was true that Beastrain wanted to give it to the collector under the name of the Black Lord, visibly nervous. The demon asked Chavan who he was. Chavan smiled and asked who he was, because he was a commodity grown by him for several decades. Chavan conceived and said that, although, there is no more. He hit the iron forest bonds with force. Chapter 8 Chavan, with a smile on his face, said that he was a commodity that had been grown for several decades by Beastrain. After thinking for a while, he added that there was no more, and forcefully struck his sword against the fetters of the iron forest. From the strong impact, the floor, 
Walls and ceiling cracked, and their stone pieces flew in different directions. Among the rising dust and a piece of the room, some kind of blue glow appeared. It was getting closer all the time and it became clear that it was a Chewin flying towards the demon, preparing to attack. The blow landed on his left shoulder, and B-Strain became visibly nervous. B-Strain ran at Chavin to launch a counterattack, but Chavin easily beat off all his blows with his sword. The demon noticed that the wound on his shoulder was not recovering. He grabbed his sore shoulder and stopped. Squeezing his shoulder to somehow calm the pain, B-Strain said that it was impossible. He looked at Chewin's sword, which had taken on a completely different look. Now it looked a lot menacing. The demon, not believing his eyes, asked if his sword was over-adapted, to which Chavin simply looked menacingly in response. The first day after reaching the 100th floor, Chavin began to doubt, maybe this tower is also part of a nightmare. Doubted it was possible, B-Strain just couldn't kill him. Doubted it was possible he had reached the limit for all people. Then these small particles began to gather into bizarre messages, one of which was addressed to the Black Lord and informed that the first selection would end very soon. After so many doubts, when he had nothing to think about. When Chavin had nothing to think about, he realized the lunge, his signature blow. Chavin attacked B-Strain with renewed vigor. His lunge was new, the lunge had great power, sweeping away everything in its path. With each new blow from Chavin, B-Strain became more and more nervous. Realizing that his business was bad, B-Strain got very angry and shouted one of the commands to the tower link. An inscription lit up in the air, which stated that all time restrictions had been lifted. After removing the restrictions, the B-Strain seems to have assumed its true form because it already looked different. With all his anger, the demon rushed to the attack, shouting that he would not hold back anymore and that the fool would surrender. B-Strain was hitting Chavin continuing to shout that in order to master the second level of adaptation immediately after completing the tutorial, an extraordinary talent is needed. But Chavin is still a stupid person. B-Strain pressed on Chavin with more force, shouting, he will never defeat him, B-Strain. Chavin tried to dodge, but the wounds on his body still became more. He wondered if this was how it would end. Chavin turned the hilt of his sword in his palm and gripped it tightly. Chavin began to strike back with incredible speed. The number of attacks he made during his entire stay to the tower almost reached 10 billion. B-Strain angrily shouted that the main game would start, so that the Chavin would not do it. When he made one of the strokes, the counter finally reached such a huge figure, something flashed in Chavin's eyes. Chavin dodged the demon's blow and jumped back. He remembered the floor keepers and realized, that's it. He lunged, his sword glowed with a bright light, some blue particles began to appear around the sword. B-Strain, seeing this blow, angrily said that no, Chavin did not just adapt. The blow of Chavin reached the demon. Everything lit up with some strange golden light, B-Strain could not believe that this was happening. The demon screamed loudly in pain. Some kind of blue stream of energy gushed out of his wound, which swirled around him. B-Strain fell to the floor, and Chavin raised his sword over him, telling him to listen to him one last time. Chavin menacingly said that people are not so weak as to be ordinary pawns. People are not just a commodity on which you can bet and sell more expensive to whomever you want. B-Strain was lying on the floor, but he looked somehow strange. Chavin said that he was no longer going to follow the path they had prepared and brought the tip of the sword closer to the demon's face. Looking up, he said he was going to go to the next floor. There was nothing left of the strong shell of the B-Strain. Now it looked like some kind of strange little bat with a lion's head. Chavin, looking at the crumbling ceiling of the tower, was going to go higher and higher until the world they had so carefully built came to an end. Chavin broke the tower system and in his user information, there was no more information, only question marks. B-Strain begged Chewin to stop, because the next floor does not exist. Chavin replied that everything is just the opposite and he says it for a reason. Chavin began to remember that there were some strange inscriptions all over the Tower of Nightmares, because of which. Chavin concluded that the Tower of Mosquitoes was only an imitation of the primordial nightmare that stands at the top of the Tree of Illusions. At first he couldn't figure out what the top of the Tree of Illusions was, but he realized one thing for sure, that these were the records of Mullark, the creator of the Tower. The message said that the name of the Tower, the Tower of Nightmares is a tutorial. And the description said that those who responded to the tower's call would be placed in an endless nightmare. Chavin asked a rhetorical question whether he was right that this place is only the root of the Tree of Illusions. And if there is a root, then there is a trunk, and if it breaks through to the top. B-Strain did not understandingly ask what Chavin wanted. Chavin's sword lit up with a bright blue flame. He raised it above him and directed this powerful energy to the ceiling. B-Strain screamed loudly, realizing that his tower would be destroyed. The tower began to collapse. The system reported that the tutorial is temporarily closed. The system detected an error loading the tutorial, which is why the download was not completed. The system began to search for the wanderers of the Tower of Nightmares, but also found nothing. The system reported that the cleaning of the game failed and the tutorial is completed. Chavin opened his eyes. He was lying on some beach. There were palm trees around and the sun was shining brightly. Chavin exhaled heavily and got to his feet, looking around. 
Seeing strange footprints leading somewhere deep into the forest, Chavin said that he had finally found him. Chapter 9 Suddenly someone's gray paw appeared, it was a pack of wolves. But they did not look like ordinary terrestrial ones, they were a couple of times larger and several times scarier. They surrounded Chavin with a roar. Their eyes were bloodshot and eager to finish off the prey as soon as possible. Suddenly one of the wolves rushed to the attack. Chavin calmly carried out a small lunge and punched the wolf in the stomach. But then the leader of this pack appeared, an unimaginably huge wolf with huge teeth and red eyes. The leader was so strong that the ground sank under his paws. Looking at the huge wolf, Chavin realized that a small lunge would not be enough for that big boy. He gripped the hilt of his sword tightly and made a normal lunge. With this blow, he pierced the wolf's chest, from which he growled loudly. Chavin tore off their horns from the defeated wolves and came to the conclusion that the monsters here are somehow weak. Then he noticed something strange. Chavin looked to the side and saw some strange monsters that looked like people, but they were green and had some kind of antennae on their heads. One of these monsters screamed, poking at the fool with his finger, but his speech was not clear, but it seems he asked to immediately give the wolf's horn. Chavin, even with suspicion turned on, could not understand anything. Chavin pointed to the horn behind his back and said that he was offering a deal, he was giving them the horn, and they were giving it to him. But the monster did not let him finish and attack. Chavin dodged the blow and was not even surprised that he could not agree. The monster continued to try to hit Chavin, to which he, calling the monster an antenna, warned that if he did not stop, he would kill them all. The monster did not even think to stop and the fool, taking out his sword, chopped these monsters into small pieces. Chavin was sitting on one of the monsters and asked if he wanted to tell him where they were at all. Chavin presented a sword to the monster's throat, to which he shouted something barely legible. Chavin grabbed the monster by the antennae that were on his head and pulled on himself. The monster screamed, writhing in pain. Chavin asked again if the monster could speak normally, but in response he heard only screams. The monster screamed that he would definitely kill the fool and bit off his tongue with his sharp teeth. Holding the torn off antennae of the monster, Chavin asked the already dead monster why he bit off his tongue. Chavin thought they were just bugs, but they have an indomitable will. After looking at the antennas in his hands, Chavin dug them into the ground and went on. In the end, he didn't find out anything, but hoping to find something useful from them, he began searching the corpses of monsters. Chavin found a small backpack of dimensions, accommodating two cubic meters of space. After examining the bag, Chavin realized that this item works as an inventory. He was glad of this, because after leaving the Tower of Nightmares, the interface system no longer works, everything stopped working at all. Putting the horns in a backpack of dimensions, Chavin said that he thought that such a thing was used everywhere on the Great Earth. A little bit resentfully, he cursed the deceiving lion. After examining the colorful stones that he collected from the monsters, he was glad that at least Suspicion shows information about the items. After examining one of the stones, Suspicion showed that it was a soul stone that increases spiritual energy. Each of the monsters kept one of these multicolored stones with them. Chavin suggested that they could be local jewelers. In any case, it was better to take these stones with you and Chavin put them in a backpack of dimensions. Chavin said that he would not like to leave everything else here, but then he felt something strange, his sword began to vibrate. Chavin took out his sword and sat down in front of the equipment. He pointed the sword in front of the equipment, when suddenly the sword had a huge mouth with which it began to devour the remaining equipment. Chavin was shocked by what he saw. After he left the tower, the sword behaved strangely. Chavin sat and watched the sword eat and thought, are they really so delicious? Chavin looked around at everything that was left after his sword had eaten and noticed the map. He opened the map, and its upper part was written Tree of Illusions Chaos. Chavin did not understand what kind of chaos it was, because the demon did not talk about it. Somewhere in the depths of the forest, many footsteps could be heard, another pack of horned wolves, tail between their legs and with fear in their eyes, was running away. Behind them ran a group of people, one of whom was a girl with red hair. The girl threw her blade and hit the man's knee. She pretended to put her hand to her mouth and apologized, saying that she accidentally threw it and she would rather hunt in the distance. The man replied that it was okay. The man got angry and decided that he would forgive her once, but only because of her charm. He hoped she wasn't so stupid that she'd hit him right in the knee by mistake. The girl apologized for something again, and the man shouted what happened there again. The ground shook under their feet. The members of the squad shouted that there was a two-horned one behind them. A huge two-horned wolf growled menacingly and rushed at the squad. The girl, laughing, ran away from him. Someone in the squad ordered everyone to step aside. Chavin watched them from the cliff. The girl seemed to him the strongest in the group, but it seems that the relationship in the group was not very good. He believed that because of such carelessness they would die and sincerely did not understand how they were able to pass the Tower of Nightmares. The man shouted for everyone to attack. He used the breath of the King of Fire. Flames began to spin around his body and weapons. The girl shouted that she would help him and flooded the man with water, from which all his fire went out, and he screamed. The girl laughed happily. The man turned to face her and called her names, to which she made an innocent face and said she just wanted to help him. 
The man looked at the girl and shouted that he did not need such help. At that moment, the wolf almost reached the man with its mouth. The squad members called him Hyan and shouted at him to be careful. Chavin realized that he needed to help them and jumped from the cliff to attack with lightning speed, flying from top to bottom. He lunged and pierced the head of the two-headed wolf through. Blood sprayed in a big stream in different directions and flooded Hyan's face. The dust that had risen from the impact gradually settled and the Chewin began to slowly appear there. Hyan shouted that who else is this? Chavin was standing right on the face of the defeated monster. The members of the squad asked Chavin if he was sure he didn't mind that they would take the body of the two-horned monster. Chavin was surprised that it was such a valuable animal. He asked if it was true that his horns were so valuable. The girl nodded in response. The squad, laughing, said that it usually takes at least ten wanderers to catch a two-horned one. Chavin remembered that the wolf he killed had five of them and concluded that the more of them, the stronger the monster should be. The girl bit her long nail angrily. She stomped her foot menacingly and sternly asked who the fool was in general. Hearing this, Chavin paid attention to her. The girl went on to say that she didn't think there would be anyone in the chaos capable of killing a two-horned one with just a lunge. She asked who he was and how he got here. After looking at the girl, he came closer to her and asked, What is chaos? Hearing the question that Chavin asked her, the girl was shocked, her eyes opened wide. Chapter 10 The girl, surprised and loudly exclaimed, Who is a fool at all? They were walking through the forest, and the members of the squad questioned him. Hyan asked if it was true that his name was Chewin. Chavin agreed. Hyan asked if he was just passing by. Chewin agreed again. With some disbelief, Hyan asked if Chewin didn't even know the local language. Chewin agreed again. Hyan replied that it was very strange, because the language barrier is a rarity. The girl asked if everything was exactly right, because he was giving the whole corpse to them. Chavin agreed again. The girl was walking behind Chavin and did not believe that he was just passing by, especially since Chavin killed the two-horned one without even using skills. The girl tried to use the skill on him, but the system informed her that she could not use the skill. The girl was surprised that she could not even study it. The system reported that the search for information was impossible. She wondered again who he was at all, because judging by the spiritual energy, he was not an adapter. She seriously told Chavin that she was interested in something, and added that she didn't think there were so many guys in chaos who could kill a two-horned one with just a lunge. The girl ordered him to tell who he was and where he came from. Chavin turned around and asked what chaos was. The girl loudly asked if the fool was joking with her. He said no. Then she screamed why he was asking such strange questions. The girl thought about it and said that since he didn't understand what she was talking about, Maybe she was using too complicated words. Chavin replied that he understood what she was saying. He pondered the question of who he was and where he came from. His former life lost its meaning after coming to the tower, but in it he was able to find new friends and create new memories. A picture with the faces of his former friends swirled in his head. However, after leaving the tutorial, they also disappeared, like an illusion. Chavin suggested that his friends most likely now live on Earth. But if one of the rewards is the preservation of memory, they probably no longer remember either him or what happened in the tower. Chavin replied to the girl that he did not remember. She pretended to make her face cute and said she understood. But then she screamed and asked if Chavin really thought that she would be led to such a stupid excuse. She advised him to come up with a more convincing story and not to compose it on the go. Chavin said he didn't remember saying he had amnesia. The girl asked what was wrong with him then. Maybe he was strong from the abyss. Chavin averted his eyes and wondered what else the abyss was. Chavin said they had had enough. His sword vibrated and he reached for it. He took out his sword, which opened its mouth wide. The girl, seeing this, was greatly surprised and realized that it was a weapon of the spirit. Chavin began to feed the weapons with equipment. The girl thought that he was not strong, but he just has a cool weapon and also demonstrates it so openly. One guy from the squad said with envy that Chavin seemed to be showing off his toys and it was very stupid. While Chavin fed the sword and told him to climb back quickly, the whole squad looked at him with envy. The girl was angry that Chewin also interfered with her task, which was to have the two-horned eat Hyan. She had an idea. She said she wouldn't bother him with questions anymore, but she wanted to offer something. The girl introduced herself by the name of Mino and after telling about the chaos, walked a little through her companions. These guys are the ruthless people of their Red Fox clan, including Hyan. Chewin realized that in short, Mino wanted him to kill them. Mino said that he would soon understand himself, because they would come for him and she also told Chewin to stop staring at them. Hyan looked at the dark starry sky and said that it was already dark and they had better set up camp because it was too dangerous to walk at night because you could come across a horned one. Chavin sat on a tree and surveyed the area while the rest of the squad sat by the fire and was about to go to bed. Later, Chavin settled down under a tree and reflected that, judging by the map, there is a village nearby. Those golden particles appeared in the air again. Chavin grabbed one of them and squeezed it in his hand. He has moved to the second level of awakening. Awareness. The guy approached Hyan and asked why Chewin had so little spiritual power. Hyan was surprised and replied that he knew it. 
They came to the conclusion that the Chewin defeated the Two Horn only thanks to a strong weapon, but the weapon of the spirit can only be obtained in the abyss, that is, in the branches of the Tree of Illusions. Chavin guessed that they were coming up with a plan. He was wondering how they would react when they found out that he really got this weapon from the root. Although the Tower Demon said that this weapon was mediocre, but in this world it was apparently valued very highly. Chavin came to the conclusion that this is not a great land. Then he heard a lot of footsteps moving towards him. Chavin realized that they were coming. Mino leaned out of the bushes and said what's the matter with Chavin, they're coming. She picked him up by the collar and said that he had a gun, so he had to kill them all and that was it. Chavin replied that no, because he had given his weapon to some sentry. Mino screamed, how could he give up his weapon just like that? Hyan called Chewin and laughing, said that his weapon would serve him well, although the Red Fox clan doesn't care if you have a weapon or not. The clan members who came were surprised that Hyan called them all to deal with the two, but decided to deal with them quickly and return. Mino screamed angrily, have the fools not seen blood for a long time? Chavin smiled, he was glad that he would finally see her real ability. Hyan ordered the clan to attack, and the thugs rushed to the attack. Mino expertly launched two blades that hit the guys in the heads, two immediately fell to the ground. She knocked out the third one with a kick to the jaw, then grabbed another blade and launched the blade at another guy. Mino stopped and saw the guy fall to the ground with a blade in his forehead. Smiling, she apologized for throwing too hard. Mino said that she was just a little angry. At this time flying blades appeared around her. She smiled and said that now they would learn something really terrible. Chapter 11 Hyan angrily said that he suspected when she accidentally pointed monsters at them. Now he had no doubt that she was a witch of destruction. Mino stared back confidently, preparing to attack. Hyan menacingly asked who needed the services of an assassin from the Dark Forest. Mino smiled and replied that it didn't matter, because the Red Fox clan had killed many adapters with their own hands, so there were a lot of people in the chaos who wanted them dead. Having finished, she launched the flying blades into the attack. Hyan laughed and said that he would never believe that the Dark Forest had agreed to stand up for some weakling. He cut through the Mino blades that were flying towards him. Taking the sword that belonged to Chavan, he smiled angrily and said that it was definitely a personal request and today she, the Witch of Destruction, would have to die. Mono sternly asked if Hyan really hopes to fight her by having a spirit weapon. Hyan laughed nastily and told her not to worry because he came prepared. Hyan began to consider the members of the Red Fox clan and came to the conclusion that they are at least at stage 1 of adaptation. The clan members were just everywhere. She quickly counted them and realized that there were as many as 40 of them. She said she knew X would be bigger. Hyan asked if the witch really thought that he would go without a safety net to the witch and the guy who easily killed the two horn. Hyan looked at Chewin and said that if he knew that he would give him his weapon so easily, then he wouldn't even have to call the master. There was a wild-looking man sitting on a tree. He had long red hair, a sharp tongue that he licked his lips with and he had a weapon with long claws on his hands. Mino, seeing the master of the Red Fox clan, was surprised to tell the Black Fox that she did not expect to see him, did he really have so much free time. The master jumped down from the tree and found himself in front of the Witch of Destruction. Their master smiled with all his teeth, which, by the way, were very long and sharp. He told the Witch of Destruction that she could consider it an honor. The Black Fox Clanter was the master of the Red Fox and was in the third stage of adaptation. The Black Fox said that half of their clan had gathered to kill her alone. The clan members looked at Mino with wild eyes. The Witch said that it was indeed an honor, but offered to wait a little longer since he was free. In fact, she doubted that she could beat him in a duel because he was at the third level of adaptation. The Witch of Destruction called out to Chavin, calling him Mr. Memory Loss, and apologized. She didn't want to say it, but she couldn't protect him. She threw him a rock and told him to take it and run. Chavin thought it was a nightmare stone. He asked what it was. Mino explained that it was a displacement stone and with its help you could find yourself in the nearest citadel. She added that she had only one such stone, so he can leave. Chavin looked at the stone. This stone could not bring him back to the past but it can save someone in the present. He gripped it tightly in his hand. He remembered Yonghuan and wondered what would have happened if this stone had been in their hands then. He was interested in the question of what would happen to Yunhuan then and now. Chavin asked if the witch had the opportunity to return to the past, if she had returned. The witch got a little angry and said why he needed to ask such a question right now. But she still replied that, of course, she wouldn't come back. The witch explained that she did not have the easiest life, so if she dies, it will be only today and she will never go back to the past. Chavin approached the Witch of Destruction and lightly took her by the shoulder, he went ahead of her, took out his sword and said that she would not die today. Mino wanted to ask something, but she didn't have time. Chavin abruptly ran forward, from which the ground under him crumpled and scattered in different directions. Chavin ran and easily chopped down the members of the Red Fox clan. The Black Fox hysterically shouted the name of the skill 14 flashes of the King of Fire. The whole clan ran into the attack with wild smiles, all the while shouting the name of the skill. Chavin said he was using the Flash of Oblivion. He accelerated at times and like lightning swept through the ranks of the clan, simultaneously cutting everyone right and left. 
Chabin drove his blade into the black fox at full speed, but he managed to substitute his gloves, which eventually cracked under the influence of Chabin's incredible strength. The gloves with which the black fox was covering his chest flew apart and Chabin drove his sword into his solar plexa. The red fox clan master's eyes widened and he screamed in pain. The black fox's body thudded to the ground. Seeing what had been done to their master, Hem became hysterical, fear filled his body. Chaewen walked up to him and stretched out his hand to take back his spirit sword. Shaking with unimaginable fear, the kneeling high and handed the sword to the owner. Seeing that Chaewen, who had just slaughtered half of the clan and easily defeated their master, regained the sword of spirits, the remaining thugs began to run away. Chaven gripped his sword tightly in his hands and used a small lunge. A stream of blue energy broke out and flew towards the fleeing members of the Red Fox clan, chopping them. The eyes of the Witch of Destruction opened wide. She opened her mouth and could not say anything. She did not understand how a fool could do such a thing with an ordinary lunge. When Chaven agreed to give them the whole corpse, and even with horns, she thought that he was just a fool, completely careless, since he was so recklessly climbing into trouble. The Witch realized that she was wrong, because he was just insanely strong. Chaven was standing with his back to her. And in front of him, after his small lunge, a rather deep ravine formed, the ground of which was blazing with fire. Mino called out to him, Chewen calmly turned his head. Mino stood with her eyes wide open. Being in the deepest shock, she asked who Chewen was. Chewen smiled and said, did she forget who he was? It claimed she knew who he was. Mino stared back blankly. Chewen, wiping his sword, pretended to laugh and said that she had really lost her memory, because he thought that only he had such a thing. After hearing this, Mino asked what kind of pettiness it was, she didn't understand if she was really offended by what she said. The witch stretched out her hand towards Chaven and asked him to give her the Stone of Return. Chaven replied that he had lost it. Mino screamed that Chaven had no idea how expensive he was, so he just told her to look for him if she wanted to. They built a new fire. Chaven sat and watched the starry sky, he could not understand why it was so quiet here. While Chaewen was feeding his sword, Mino was hysterically rummaging through the dimension's backpack, accusing him of losing such an expensive thing because of him. Chaewen repeated to her that she knew everything. Mino asked what she knew about. Chaewen explained that about him. He smiled and said he was human. Incredulous, Mino asked if he was joking. Chaewen asked if she was human. Mino agreed. Clenching his fist tightly, Chaewen replied that it was enough. Looking at Chaewen, Mino couldn't figure out what was wrong with his face and she was wondering if he really thinks that being human is enough. This story begins on one of the very rainy days. A black cat sits on the roof of one of the houses of the night city and looks at the street between the tall houses, in which the lights have not been lit for a long time. A message with a fresh weather forecast sweeps through the city. The local station of the city reports that heavy rain, which began last night, will continue for about the whole of this week. Also, the Meteorological Service issued a warning about heavy rains of the yellow hazard category, which in general may be upgraded to the red line. But not all houses and buildings are not lit yet. A black cat is sitting right on the roof of the shop, where the lights have not yet gone out. There is a sign on the door with a brief and clear inscription, Open. The owner of this bookstore slowly rearranges the books on the shelves. His hands are decorated with elegant white gloves. The owner is afraid that because of this rain there will be no visitors again today. A man frowns at such negative thoughts. But this person is trying to cheer himself up by the fact that there is a small chance that someone will forget his umbrella and then he will have to look for a place to hide from the rain. Then this unlucky person will have the honor to enter this mysterious store. A man is pleased with such thoughts, he continues to look at books and rearrange them on other shelves. The owner of the bookstore calls himself such a good and kind person, and he hopes that this little act of his romance will bring him income. Although not, let it be better that this romantic act will bring the man more clients. He would like to talk to the visitors of the bookstore. For an elegant man, of course, money is not important, but customers are more important. It would also be very cool if visitors were impressed by the kindness and enthusiasm of the owner and under this impression people would take and buy a couple of books from the topics that are available in this store. At this time, the night sky is decorated with a beautiful bright blue game that glows with a bright light. Terrible things happen under the moon. A lady with a sword is fighting with unknown people. She hits a huge bald man in a robe with a sword, right on the right hand. It was a precise and powerful blow that mercilessly chopped off this man's arm. And the girl moves on. Then two more opponents run after her, they are extremely negative. Then the girl uses a dagger and with a quick movement of her hand and strikes the masked guy with this dagger, which suddenly appeared in her hand. A sharp dagger strikes the enemy with a direct hit to the head. The second man is shocked by this turn of events. While he is distracted from what is happening, his opponent girl is standing behind him. She radiates a negative and hostile aura. The girl grabbed the guy in the mask by the throat and is ready to cut him with another dagger. But the girl decides not to cut the guy's throat. She deftly moves her hands and wrings his neck. A sharp crunch characteristic of this action sweeps through the sky. The girl throws the dead guy in the mask away from her. Now, all the enemies of the mysterious lady have been defeated. Now she is alone in the middle of the street, and a downpour is pouring down on her from the sky, which still does not stop. 
throwing the lifeless body away from her. The girl realizes that she was previously injured because it was painful for her to turn and move her body. She has a characteristic wound on her beard, from which scarlet blood flows almost like a stream. The girl is very glad that it's finally over. It looks like three or four of her thighs are broken, but that's okay. She is thinking about what she should do in this situation. It also seems to her that even with the effect of spoiled blood, self-healing of the body and healing of wounds will take at least an hour. But it will be dangerous for the girl to wait this time on the street, it will really be dangerous, she urgently needs to find at least some shelter. A girl needs time, which is already short. She slowly, holding on to her wound, goes to seek shelter, and her defeated enemies remain behind her, they will never get up again, now they are doomed to eternal rest. The faces of these four men express complete fear and horror, he froze in these expressions. Meanwhile, the girl is carefully exploring the area, she has not yet given up in search of shelter for herself. Suddenly, among the closed and dark buildings, she notices a light in the windows, and on the building itself he sees a sign open. The girl is surprised. Is this a bookstore? It's very strange. Why is he the only one of all the other stores open in this weather? Is it just a coincidence or is it a trap? You need to take this into account and be attentive to the end. The lady is slowly approaching this mysterious bookstore. She still doubts whether she should go there. Suddenly, the situation turns out to be more deplorable for her than it is now if she goes there but then she realizes that she has no choice. In any case, she needs to hide somewhere as soon as possible. The girl tells herself to be brave and enter this bookstore. Finally, she opens the front door of the store. He sees a bell above the door. So now the owner of the store knows that someone has come to him, apparently another person who needs help in such rainy weather. The dark-haired girl begins to move deeper into the bookstore. She slowly but surely approaches the counter, where the owner of the store himself is sitting and reading a book. Seeing the girl, he was very happy and immediately distracted from reading. He closes the book and immediately greets the girl in his store. Here the man abruptly changes his face. He notices a lot of suspicious things only in the appearance of the lady. He says out loud that, apparently, he did not wait for customers for so long for nothing because such a beautiful guest came to him. Wherever you look, this mysterious girl has a lot of stories. Now she's all wet, water is dripping from her, and she looks like a battered witch. The store owner will have to use his sales skill. Although, he abruptly changes his goal, because he would rather use the skill of talkativeness. Then the man offers the mysterious guest to take and use hot towels. If the lady wants to warm up, then she can safely take them. The lady does not like the words of the owner of the bookstore that he has been waiting for visitors for so long. It is also very suspicious that at first glance there is everything in this place that she might need right now. And it's all in a very ordinary bookstore, apparently. This is not just an accident. It is quite possible that this person knows something that he should not know. The girl takes an ordinary towel and begins to wipe the water from her face with it. She thanks the owner of the store for his help, but she needs to warm up. This is enough. At this point, the lady assumes what kind of faction this person may be. From where? From the secret tower. Or maybe from the faction of the Society of Truth. Or is it even worse and this man was present at the Pueblo's party? So many questions, so few answers yet the girl has. The lady can't know for sure, it's all at the level of her guesses. But in any case, this guy is not just a bookstore owner. He clearly has his own secrets. Then she decides to ask why the bookstore owner was waiting for her. Why did he say that? Then the man stretches out his hand towards the girl and says that yes, it's amazing, it's amazing how fate can sometimes bring two strangers together at first glance. The mysterious man replies that it seems that the girl is in an extremely difficult situation, so she needs help. At this moment, the man uses psychological suggestion, his first technique. It lies in the fact that words about problems do not carry any meaning by themselves. This is an ordinary psychological suggestion. The lady is in shock, as this gentleman said exactly. She has no choice but to respond positively to this, because the mysterious man is absolutely right. The reception continues its action. After all, as soon as a visitor relaxes and starts complaining about his problems, Mr. Lin immediately begins pouring honey into his visitor's ears in order to get closer faster. The lady says that she had one unpleasant problem. She thinks that right now she cannot judge for sure whether this man is her friend or vice versa, so she agrees with his words in order to study his personality and his goals in more detail. Mr. Lin says he regrets it, but if he understands correctly. But most likely, the girl's problems are problems in a relationship. Is he right? While saying this, Mr. Lin pours tea into a mug. And here is the second reception of the insidious Mr. Lin. And these are vague speeches. This is a very versatile technique, much respected charlatan and magician Lin. Its essence is that the meaning of a man's words should be so unclear as to subsequently leave room for maneuver, both for himself and for his interlocutor. The girl is stunned by this assumption of the man. What does he mean by that? Is that a plan somehow? Or what? Either he is trying to intimidate the lady, or he has known about everything for a long time. Then Mr. Lin puts a chair to the table and invites the girls to sit down and continue their conversation about all this. Unless, of course, the girl is not against such an offer. The lady is even more wary. 
Did outsiders really become aware of the uprising of the White Wolves in such a short time? This can't be happening. After all, it can't be that Mr. Lin guessed all this so simply and by chance. Unless of course he was in control of the situation from the very beginning. Then everything goes exactly according to Mr. Lin's plan. She sits down at the table and holds out the tea that was poured for her earlier. She began to tell me that she had really been betrayed. One guy is to blame for everything that happened to her. At this time, Mr. Lin learns even more about the mysterious girl. He was able to see it in her, with the help of the egg of the magic mirror. This is the egg of a magical creature capable of seducing the human mind. Because of this egg, years of friendly communication fell victim to greed and greed for profit, and it all went so far that the guy who caused the unpleasant mysterious lady used the forces of the organization to destroy the girl's former friends. This is a rather sad story. Mr. Lin is very surprised by this girl's story. That's the real drama. There were relationships, betrayal, and further depression. Now it's clear why she has such big problems. We urgently need to find the right medicine for the lady. Mr. Lin says there are only two sides to all this. It is possible that the girl has experienced betrayal from a person close to her, but then it means that it will happen to everyone. Now the girl is finally sure that Mr. Lin has known about everything for a long time. No, at the first opportunity, people will go on about greed, according to the same scenario. Sooner or later, everything will be the same and will fall into its predetermined places. The girl says that Mr. Lin is absolutely right about everything. But this betrayal cost the girl dearly and also hurt her badly. She has already seen all the ugliness of human nature, so what's the point of it at all? Mr. Lin analyzes what the girl said, that she really lost a lot and suffered a lot. Well, that's it. Now Mr. Lin understands everything. It must be that, most likely, the girl received a strong emotional trauma from a terrible person who cheated on the poor girl. And now, at this very moment, a master like Mr. Lin, the master of eloquence, comes into play. He says that all this has its advantages. But now, the girl knows what is real and what is not. And a girl should never feel sorry for the people who hurt him, because they are not worthy of any pity. Even if the girl was once close to such people, it seems to the girl that Mr. Lin's goal has become clear to her. Was he trying to use her to develop some kind of plan against the hunters? Mr. Lin is so clever with cunning and grace, while hating hunters. It looks like this bookstore owner is a high-ranking dark magician. After the girl listened attentively to Mr. Lin's speech and now asks him what, in his opinion, she should do. Then Mr. Lin changes his face and tells the girl that since these are ordinary and worthless people, then she can calmly take revenge on them. And here is the time for Mr. Lin's reception, and these are purposeful tips. The man says that the girl should not be condescending with them in any case. The essence of the reception is to keep the visitor. And in order to keep the visitor, you need to make him a competent offer, taking into account all life circumstances, which is very different for the better from other offers. What? Should a girl take a turn away from these people? She is not mentally ready for this in any way. It seems that Mr. Lin is not going according to plan at all. But it doesn't matter, because everything is ready. It's time to really get down to business. Here Mr. Lin smiles slyly and says that he thinks that the girl needs a certain book. Here he abruptly puts a book on the table, which, in the opinion of the gentleman, is suitable for the situation in which his guest today found herself. It's good that Mr. Lin was reading the confession just before all this. This difficult book is perfect for such a confused girl. What's it? Blood and the Beast. The girl has never even heard of such a title, she sees this book for the first time. But why did Mr. Lin decide to give it to the girl right now? What's the catch? Then the girl decides to open this book. But this is not an easy book at all, as it seemed at first glance. Inside it, on almost all the pages of the book, there is a strange dark red substance. This substance begins to envelop the girl with fast and faithful movements. It happens so quickly that she does not have time to understand anything. Gradually, this substance takes the form of a scarlet beast with huge white fangs. Now the girl is enveloped in tentacles. The girl does not yet understand what the meaning of all this is. Then the tentacles definitely turn into a beast. This beast has already lagged behind the girl's body. Now they are in a mug with a drink to the girl. The transformation into a beast has just been completed. Turning into a beast, a power obtained and controlled by blood. Hunters get their power from fantasy beasts by injecting dangerous tainted blood into themselves. At the mouth of the beast there is now a huge syringe with the same spoiled blood. There is also the fact that the higher the concentration of tainted blood, the greater the strength of the hunter and the stronger the transformation into a beast, which ultimately leads to death. However, Mr. Lin came up with a way to control this tainted blood. This is enough to undermine the entire system of power on which the community of hunters relies. Now the girl has finally understood what Mr. Lin wants from her. Did he really want her to do that? The gentleman says yes, that's what he needs. But all this is not for the sake of repentance, but for the girl to be honest with herself. This man probably knows that even if a broken woman looks strong and resilient, in fact she is still sad inside herself. And so, just a couple of words of comfort and a recommendation of a good book, as this girl is already on the verge of tears. Now it's time for Mr. Lin to use the original text from the book itself to instill self-confidence in this girl. 
He begins to make a speech, approaching the girl from behind. The book says that the trumpets will sound, marking the beginning of the day of judgment, and the hero will appear before the Almighty Judge with this book in his hands, and he will declare what he does, what he thinks, who he is, with the same frankness with which the hero talks about good and evil. Every person has the basest animal desires. Is all this true? Did she really write in confessions? Now the girl should not worry at all, because calming people is Mr. Lin's specialty. She just needs to accept it and trust Mr. Lin, and after that, the girl will have a new life. And here is the fourth reception of the mysterious Mr. Lin. This is the final conclusion. It turns out that after the visitor has poured out his emotions to Mr. Lin, give him positive instructions, as well as self-confidence, so that the guest can act and solve the problems he will face in the future. So, it was an eloquence lesson from Mr. Lin, did all the readers remember everything. Next, the man raises the mug with the drink up and says that he and the girl should drink to a completely new future. The girl also raises her mug up. She sincerely thanks the owner of the bookstore for his helpful advice. She will definitely follow them. After that, the girl drinks the drink offered to her in one gulp. Mr. Lin did not expect this at all, because there was definitely boiling water in the mug. She shouldn't have drunk it so quickly, but she took it and really did it. But the owner of the store just wanted to warm the girl from the inside with this drink. He carefully examines the girl. It seems that everything is fine with her now. Is this the power of the legendary skeleton? Now Mr. Lin sums up what just happened. He also asks the girl that she must have filled out a library card. Then the girl takes a pen and writes her name in the card in the line visitor. It turns out that the girl's name is Jai Jixu. Mr. Lin seems very familiar with this name. He definitely remembers one famous tycoon, Jai Bonong, who led the underground resource development in the lower city. And it seems that Jai Jixu is his only daughter's name. Mr. Lin is in shock. What a catch. A man can do a lot with this girl. He is very inspired. But now you need to drop your insidious ideas. Because first of all you need to earn enough money to repair the store and then everything else. The gentleman needs to calm down urgently. After all, the best way to earn money is to receive money regularly. Next, the store owner tells Jai Jixiu that the book in his store is taken for a month and the maximum delay in the delivery of the book is a week. Mr. Lin also adds that it's still raining outside, even a downpour, so he gives Jai an umbrella along with the book. The girl needs to remember to take it with her when she returns the book back to the store later. Jai Jixiu is very grateful for the help she received. She is also interested in whether she can get to know Mr. Lin better. The owner of the bookstore is very surprised by this question. What is it? Did his earlier words sound like a real flirtation? But no, the gentleman needs to respond adequately to this. He tells Jai Chixiu that his name is Lin Jai and he is a very ordinary but very sympathetic bookstore owner. The girl understands that the man does not intend to reveal his true identity at all. But at least for now, he should be on Jai Chixiu's side. Next, the girl opens the umbrella and says goodbye to Mr. Lin, wishing him a good night. Lin Jai tells the girl to take care of herself, and he will meet the girl once again. Lin Jai is very happy that another good deed has been done, and doing good deeds every day, a person will feel good. It is quite possible that this is what the being who forced Lin Jai to cross into this world had in mind. Next, the owner of the store needs to do the cleaning and prepare for the meeting of the next visitor. If today, of course, someone else looks into Lin Jai's bookstore, Jai Chixiu is moving further and further away from the store. She thinks Lin Jai is a very creepy guy, so now she must deal with the trader as soon as possible, and then come back again and meet the owner of the bookstore. The plan is very clear. Here a mysterious figure in a dark hat and an umbrella with an umbrella appears on the way of the girl. Jai Jixiu feels that something is wrong, so he grabs the book confession more tightly. Chapter 2 Azur Continent, Nazan City It's raining heavily in the city again. Lin Jai is revisiting his huge book library again. He comes across a book called Rituals and Magic by the authorship of Lin Jai himself. He opens and also glances over the text, reading this book. The owner of the bookstore feels a pleasant nostalgia. After his transition, Lin Jai settled in the city of Nazan. And now he has been living here for three years. In 2017, Lin Jai worked at the university library. Then he was a doctor of folklore studies. A student is approached by a library employee. She says it's time to close, then why isn't Lin Jai going anywhere? He replies that he wants to read some more books. He tells the girl to leave, and then he himself will close the door to the library. The girl understood Lin Jai. She is saying goodbye to the teacher and will be glad to see him tomorrow. She's already leaving. Another girl meets a girl from the library. She says it's late enough, then why isn't teacher Lin leaving yet? Another girl apologizes for being late at the library. She is sorry that she made her friend wait. She also says that it's because teacher Lin loves books very much. That's why he decided to stay a little longer. The girl once heard that he even seems to collect books and spends his entire salary on buying them. The girlfriend of this girl does not believe in what she said. It seems to her that the girl is simply exaggerating, because this cannot be. At this moment, the teacher finally finished reading the last book he took. It's already deep night outside. A bright blue moon is shining in the sky. There are no clouds in the sky. Lin Jai, as promised earlier, closes the library door. 
Now, all the preparations for the ritual are completed. On the floor, right in front of Lin Jai, there is a huge bright yellow pentagram. She is very mobile, spinning from side to side. Inside it there are many different mysterious symbols, words and signs. Lin Jai is pleased that the preparation of the ritual site has finally been completely completed. A man knows that wishes definitely don't come true by magic. But as long as Lin Jai has a single glimmer of hope, he is willing to pay any price for it. He puts his hand on the pentagram and asks her to give him all the books of this world. But the man's request for some reason does not work. Lin Jai is very upset about the failure. But, on the other hand, he knew that this would happen, that nothing would work out. After all, some magic circle will not fulfill his wish. But suddenly, some scary creature from another world appears behind the guy's back. This creature has no face. It has only a huge mouth, from which snow-white teeth are visible. At first, Lin Jai does not realize that he is not alone in the building. But when the monster approaches the guy from behind, when he feels someone breathing from behind, but quickly turns around, he suddenly feels uncomfortable. He turns around abruptly. But strangely enough, the monster is no longer there. Instead of no, there is a huge door behind Lin Jai, which depicts a huge glowing bright eye. It's like he's watching a guy from another world. This door looks very unusual. It depicts bright red patterns that are located along the entire length of the door. This door took all of Lin Jai's attention. After all, it was at this moment that the man realized that if he did not open this mysterious door now, then his dream of books would definitely come true. But the price of this adventure is never to return to Earth again. This is a very high price. But Lin Jai values his dream too much, so he is willing to pay such a seemingly high price. But a satisfied grin appears on his face. Lin Jai has almost opened this magic door. But this moment is already in the past. Lin Jai walked through that door and ended up in Nazan. Lin Jai he didn't know that so much time had passed since that moment, Mr. Lin didn't even have time to notice it. This is all because Lin Jai's current life is no different from his previous life. It seems to a man that the payment he once paid is quite decent. Shouldn't such a ritual be paid for? The answer is obvious. In this world, there is no system that could issue tasks. And also some cranks do not come to Lin Jai, so the days of staying in Nazan flow so calmly and so unhurriedly. Isn't that great? Lin Jai is really happy about this. He is positively glowing with happiness. He likes everything in his current reality. He does not regret at all that he exchanged this world for Earth. After all, now, Lin Jai can update the bookshelves every day, and also read so many books that are still unread. This is basically what Lin Jai has been dreaming about all his life. He just needs to communicate with visitors. It turns out that life's happiness lies in such little things. Lin Jai made himself some tea again, but now he was thinking about something again. He worries that his bookstore has not had new visitors for a long time. And it seems that Lin Jai's communication skills have not deteriorated yet. This is very cool. But one thing pleases that the girl who previously came to Lin Jai will certainly become happier today. Meanwhile, Jai Jixiu is standing in the middle of the street without moving. A man in a raincoat and hat is slowly but surely approaching a very frightened girl. Oddly enough, this man also has a book in his hand. I wonder where she came from. At this moment, the man continues to move towards Jai Jixiu. Here, he passes by the girl. At that moment, he notices the girl's book confession from the girl's hand. But poor Jai Jixiu can't move, her hand is frozen. Then the man in the mask turns his gaze back to the girl who has become petrified with fear and fright. The stranger in the hat praises the confession that the girl chose, as if he approves of her choice of the book. He says Jai Jixiu is definitely lucky to have her. The girl feels trapped, as if a snake has encircled her and is curling on the girl's body, gradually depriving her of the opportunity to breathe deeply. Jai Jixiu even had sweat on her forehead. She really is completely terrified of this man and his heavy and oppressive aura. In his hands he carries an interesting book. This is emptiness and silence. The stranger walks on, and Jai Jixiu leans against the wall. She doesn't care about the rain anymore, so she dropped the umbrella from her hands, which should protect the girl from the rain. Who was it? This can't be happening. Was this frightening man heading to Mr. Lin's bookstore? Apparently, this is so. Perhaps it's time for the man to return the book to Lin Jai's library. Meanwhile, this person is already on the doorstep of the store. He opens the door and the bell above the front door, which indicates that the man is already inside. Lin Jai sees a new visitor and immediately greets him. Lin Jai did not see the guest's face, so he did not immediately react to the sky. But when he turned around and examined the man, he realized that in front of him was already a familiar person. This man's name is Frank. Apparently, this is not the first time he has appeared in this bookstore. Lin Jai assumes that Frank has come to return the book he took earlier. Frank seems happy to see Lin Jai and they immediately walk towards each other. Frank addresses Lin Jai more formally. He doesn't understand how Mr. Lin dares to pronounce his name. Lin Jai says that, of course, he dares. But he's already calling Frank by his last name, that is, Wilda. Frank is also unhappy that Lin Jai has a new visitor, because she took away a book that Frank Wilda himself often reads. Lin Jai says that he decided that it was confession that would be useful right now. Frank also notices that he took this book last time. Then Lin Jai rather rudely says that, 
As he said earlier, it would be very difficult for an old man like Wilder to read the confession, but Frank did not believe the owner of the bookstore. Frank says that after reading it, he realized that it was too difficult to understand, and there was a whole world in it, from birth to death. And based on his superficial knowledge, it will be difficult to imagine how great the person who managed to write such an amazing and wonderful book is. Lin Jai says that the author of this book is a dead giant. Then Frank says that since it was a giant, it's not surprising at all. At this time, Jai Jixiu overhears a conversation between two men. Now, the girl understands what kind of stranger appeared before her earlier. Of course this man is Frank Wilder, the Black Faceless. This is a dark magician of the destructive level. Unbelievably, according to the rules established by the Society of Truth in 1788, all supernatural beings are divided into four levels, which is also called the APRN qualification. That is, the qualification of abnormal, frightening, destructive, indescribable. And here is Black Faceless Frank Wilder, destructive, a dark magician. His bright distinguishing feature is a mask on his face, and also dark green, almost turquoise eyes. For this strong magician, there is a reward that the secret tower will give to the one who catches Frank Wilder, now his exact location is unknown. One day Frank got into a fight with one of the best fighters of the secret tower, and as a result of this powerful battle, an area of almost 10,000 kilometers was destroyed, and it was in that battle that Frank Wilder moved to his destructive level. There are only less than 10 supernatural beings of the destructive level in Nazin, and there are less than 100 of them in all of Azir. Jai Jixiu is in complete shock. Out of anger she even destroys the wall next to the girl's hand. She doesn't understand at all how Lin Jai is chatting so sweetly and calmly with such a strong and terrifying supernatural being. She decides that she has nothing more to do here. She picks up an umbrella from the ground and decides to go home. Jai Jin feels like she has stumbled upon a very unusual person, in the person of Lin Jai. Now the girl finally goes away from the bookstore. Further, it seems to Lin Jai that Mr. Wilder is in a very bad mood today. And if he needs his help, then let him not hesitate to ask for help. Lin Jai thinks that Frank Wilder is one of the few old visitors to his store who comes here just out of habit. Along the way, Lin Jai puts the book Frank brought to his place on one of the shelves. And of course, such a lonely old man just needs special attention and company. As far as Lin Jai knows, Frank Wilder has two children, and the old man has a bad relationship with both children. Lovers constantly leave him, and other magicians dislike Frank, in particular, because of his appearance, so this old man is always lonely. He really is an ordinary lonely old man. This situation reminds Lin Jai of how they met Frank as much as two years ago. The meeting of the men really happened two years ago. Back then, Lin Jai already had his precious bookstore. On one of these rainy days, a new guest came to Lin Jai. He came in quietly, a mask on his face hiding the appearance of a man. Lin Jai's instinct told him that it seemed that this visitor would be very interesting. Judging by his clothes, Frank Wilder was not deprived of money, but for some reason he deliberately hides his face, it seems that he is a loner. At first glance, Lin Jai seems to be a man of science. Also, apparently, he is a research scientist. Yes, this is a good chance to talk to the owner of the store with such a colorful person. If you are careful, you can get yourself such a mature enough client. A man with a mask on his face is interested in who is the owner of this bookstore. He also asks if it is possible to return old books that have been read for a long time. Frank Wilder has several old books that may well carry collector's value. Lin Jai says with a smile on his face that yes, the store has such a function. Books, of course, can be handed over, but you need to wait a little. Lin Jai offers Wilder a drink. He only asks for ordinary black tea and nothing more. Lin Jai offers tea to get a little closer to an interesting guest. Frank thanks for the tea, but the man's rather old face is very scary, and therefore he does not want to cause the store owner unnecessary trouble. Lin Jai says he doesn't see this as a problem at all. Frank Wilder is still primarily a guest of the store, how can Mr. Lin be afraid of him? Moreover, only very stupid people look only at the appearance of a person and do not even try to look into the human soul. Frank is pleased with these words of the store owner. He says Lin Jai is pretty smart. Then it's better to be polite on his part and remove the mask from his face. And then thank Lin Jai for this tea. The owner of the store says that Frank Wilder's face is more strange than scary. Frank takes the tea and starts tasting it. Then it seems to Lin Jai that Frank's mask hides old battle scars. But then the hero tries to forget about it and drive these thoughts away. He definitely shouldn't pry into his guest's personal life. But judging by the books that Frank Wilder brought, he studies many languages and is a highly qualified linguist. Then it's worth trying to start a conversation with a guest from here. Frank says this tea is really good. He thanks Lin Jai for him. He says it's not worth the thanks. Mr. Lin also says that the books his guest brought are very interesting. They contain studies of very rare and even already dead languages. There is magic between the words and lines of the book, it's really amazing. Frank Wilder is in complete shock. I am shocked at how the shop owner could feel the magical power of these manuscripts at all. How is this possible? After all, Frank had erased all traces before that. 
And yet, even a supernatural being of the destructive level would not be able to sense anything at all. And all the time Lin Jai is so calm and polite. But what kind of person is this? He is clearly very unusual. Mr. Lin is so carefree. But it's possible that he doesn't feel the aura, but he's definitely an unusual person. Then Frank Wilder says he does a little language research. And if Mr. Lin has any research in this area, but he could give it to him to read, it would be quite an interesting experience. Lin Jai says that he is not an expert in linguistics at all, but in turn he is engaged in research in related fields of science. It seems that Lin Jai has a couple of suitable books. It seems to the hero that, of course, professional scientists get used to physical loneliness, but even they can't stand the loneliness of the soul. It may be a good idea to point out a new direction in this matter. Therefore, Lin Jai wanted to recommend a book to Frank Wilder. The trick is that this book uses one of the most complex dialects in existence, which are referred to as the language of the devil. And if Frank is not a real linguist, then he will never understand the meaning of the text written in the book. From this book, Frank Wilder slips a mug of tea out of his hands. Frank is very excited about this book, he is very excited about it. So there is a devil's tongue in this book. Interesting. Lin Jai is glad that he coped with his task and was able to please his new client. Frank says that this is a very, very rare book. He is very interested in where it came from the owner of this bookstore. Lin Jai, much to my regret, cannot tell the whole truth. They are not in China now. Therefore, the hero can only say one thing. This language is one of the glorious, magnificent, and ancient civilization. It was widespread in her. Unfortunately, Lin Jai is unable to return there for certain reasons. Frank is interested in what the bookstore owner said. What kind of ancient civilization is this? Moreover, the hero uses such a nostalgic tone. Because of this, Mr. Lin is somehow really connected with this civilization and with this book. Was she really that intimidating? Now Frank Wilder is even more interested in what kind of Lin Jai is such a creepy creature. Then Mr. Lin says that he still does not know the name of the man in the mask. I would like to find out as soon as possible. The stranger says his name is Frank Wilder, and his position is not really worth mentioning. In response, he also asks the name of the owner of this bookstore. The hero says that his name is Lin Jai, and he is the owner of this bookstore. And Frank Wilder shouldn't be so formal and polite. Next, Wilder builds a very cunning face, by the way, says that he recently encountered some difficulties in his research. But it was thanks to the devil's tongue that Lin Jai lent him that he was able to find a new direction. And now, in order to complete the research, Frank needs additional literature about similar languages. Lin Jai likes the fact that Wilder really calls the book the language of the devil, although this is just one of the funny titles. This really makes Mr. Lin laugh a little. But then he gets serious again, because he has a job looking for a new book for Frank Wilder. So the two mysterious men met. After that, Frank often comes to this bookstore. Chapter 3 40 years ago, one winter day, another young Frank Wilder came to the forest and now stands on a rock, right in front of a huge magician in the king, which also inspires with its size. So far, Frank is looking forward to the upcoming fight with the mysterious magician. Then the magician utters a phrase in which the magician orders Frank to die. Is this really the power that magicians use? Magicians manipulate the language and writing of power. It happened in the world that light magicians write spells, but dark ones take and pronounce these spells. The huge magician says that after becoming a dark magician, while Frank Wilder will try to find the voice of his soul. Further, realizing his own fear, Frank will definitely find the path leading to such a level of a magician. Frank is a bit lost in his past, but Lin Jai's voice brings him back to reality. Lin Jai asks if Frank wants to borrow a book of the same genre this time. Or is he interested in something else now? Frank Wilder replies that yes. He needs a book in the genre that he usually takes here. That book was too complicated. And besides, it seems that there is a dialect of another language in the book, which is deeply connected with the cultural customs of people. Frank wants to better understand the hidden meaning of what is written there. Lin Jai understood his client's request. He needs a second to think about it a little. At this moment Frank waits patiently, slowly sipping tea. He thinks that Mr. Lin is as unselfish and generous with him as ever. It turns out that two years ago he had a difficult battle with an unpleasant man for him, Joseph. As a result of this battle, Frank Wilder was seriously injured. And so, when Frank lost his way, he came to Lin Jai and he instructed Frank on the right path. Also, Mr. Lin is able to pick up just the rarest books and completely hide his aura from Frank, and he is a magician of the destructive level. It's unthinkable. Meanwhile, Lin Jai assumes that this man sitting in front of him must be a hermit scholar whose strength goes far beyond the divine level. And now, two years later, Frank Wilder finally managed to start researching forbidden spells based on the remaining knowledge from that very book. And Lin Jai did all this thanks to this omniscient and well-read scientist. This time Frank Wilder is simply obliged to express his gratitude properly. Lin Jai reviews the books on the shelves, and then his hand stops at a book called Rituals and Magic, authored by Lin Jai himself. Lin Jai apologizes for keeping his client waiting. Mr. Lin thinks that perhaps he is a little arrogant, but he suddenly thought that this book is quite suitable for Frank Wilder. He's even a little embarrassed by what he said. 
Next, Lin Jai hands the book to Frank. He does not yet understand that Mr. Lin has such a reaction. Further, the hero says that to be honest, he is actually quite confident about this study, he is still confused. Frank carefully examines this book. Suddenly he notices that the authorship belongs to Lin Jai himself. Wilda is as surprised as possible. Are these rituals and magic really written by Lin Jai? The hero says that this is his rather insignificant work, he is even ashamed of it. Frank Wilder could have expected absolutely anything, but not this. Where did Mr. Ling get such knowledge about the world and its components? The cult of the truth of knowledge, then the cult of the moon and finally the cult of the high fog wall. These are the three main beliefs that Frank knows. But such a faith as the corpse eaters, Wilder had never heard of such a thing. Also, rituals and magic has such an evil aura, the writer of this book is clearly not a kind person. Is Lin Jai really going to create his own faith? Then Frank Wilde asks Lin Jai if rituals are his area of research. Mr. Lin says that it is, but this is just part of his research. These studies that completely changed the fate of the hero. He wanted to continue with a more detailed account of this, but decides that it's better not to do it, at least not today. He immediately tells Frank to forget about his words. He shouldn't think about it. Frank Wilde is surprised by this formulation of Lin Jai. What is it? Did this really happen a long time ago? But what exactly? Is this the story that changed the fate of the hero? So that's how it is. Now Frank understands more well what is the matter here. According to Frank Wilde, Lin Jai is a scientist who researches forbidden topics and has such great power. This is a person who is doomed to be excluded from the main community. And it is because of this that Mr. Lin hides himself and his abilities from the rest of the world. Frank further notes that rituals and magic looks like this book is bound by hand. Why is this so? Lin Jai says that it is because of some unfortunate circumstances. He had no time to publish the book, so he had to save only the version that was made by Kin Jai himself manually. Deep down, Lin Jai is very sorry that he did not have time to release the book. If only the hero hadn't been transported to this world, but then he would have definitely managed to do it. After all, it was thanks to this book that Lin Jai received the degree of associate professor. Lin Jai even clenches his hand into a fist. Frank also notices this. But then Mr. Lin says that since he and Frank have common interests, he will gladly give the man this book. But of course, if Frank Wilder does not trust him for some reason, but Lin Jai can simply recommend some other book. Frank is very surprised by this action. Does Lin Jai really want to take and lend him this priceless original, even though Rituals and Magic is an experimental work? And besides, this book was never published. Frank Wilder sincerely thanks Lin Jai for being so generous with him. And it is also a great honor for Frank that he had the opportunity to read Lin Jai's books. But Frank also doesn't understand what Lin Jai really wants from him. He says that this work is precious and there is only one copy, so there is no doubt that it is a very painstaking work. Frank Wilder is really worried about the fact that Lin Jai is ready to give such a very important thing into the hands of a nasty and suspicious old man. Frank Wilder decides that perhaps Mr. Lin wants to put some kind of experiment on him. Lin Jai thinks to himself about how kind Frank is. After all, at first he was interested in all this, but when he learned that this book was the only one of its kind, on the contrary, he was ashamed to borrow it. Apparently, he doubts something. But Lin Jai is seriously determined that he is ready to dispel any doubts of Frank. Lin Jai says there is no need to worry about anything. Mr. Lin sincerely believes that Frank is able to increase the value of the book Rituals and Magic, because the hero's research is valuable only when other people can notice it. And as for this book and its only copy, this book no longer has any meaning for Lin Jai. Since today's Lin Jai already owns a whole book collection, the rest is no longer important. He can make a copy of the book at any time and all because the knowledge and thoughts in Lin Jai's head cannot be stolen. As you know, you can only steal fame and wealth. That fame and fortune are not completely unimportant for Mr. Lin. Lin Jai hopes that Frank understands him. Frank Wilde seemed to understand right away. Lin Jai is a little unhappy that Frank has been agreeing to the book for so long. It would be better for him to take it. Now is the last chance to take this value for yourself. After all, Frank Wilde is a lonely old man. And besides, a scientist, he definitely needs this very fame and this very wealth to compensate for the emptiness in his soul. But unfortunately, such thinking can turn into painful fanaticism, and this is very harmful to health, so you need to give Frank Wilder the opportunity to be closer to the crowd and feel the care and kindness of the people around him again. Lin Jai hopes that Frank understands him, so many hints have already been made. Frank departs a little from his shock state and says that he understands the hero, and he is also very grateful for such advice. Indeed, fame and fortune are not important. Did Lin Jai want to give Frank a warning not to divulge anything about this to other people? The scarred man has not fully understood this moment yet. Lin Jai feels the growing question and answers that he does not mind at all if Frank Wilder decides to recommend this book to someone else from his friends and acquaintances. Now Frank has no more questions, he understands everything. Therefore, the man promises to do everything possible. It seems to Frank that this is the price that Mr. Lin requires him to pay for using this book. The man really hopes that he will be able to distribute the work of Lin Jai. 
it is necessary not only not to expose the identity of the owner, but also not to distribute its contents. It seems that only Frank Wilder is able to fully study this book, and then verbally convey its essence. Frank also needs to be careful and careful again. Next, Frank thanks Lin Jai for his long-term guidance. He wants to thank the hero with something. He really hopes that this gift will not upset Mr. Lin. Frank gives an unusual gargoyle to Lin Jai's bookstore as a thank you. It looks quite interesting and frightening. Lin Jai is very surprised by this gift. Frank says that this is not a very valuable thing, and it certainly will never pay off the value of rituals and magic in Mr. Lin's help, but Frank asks to accept it as a sign of his gratitude. This gargoyle is the work of Frank Wilder since his studies. His teacher highly appreciated it. She has sufficient magical resistance and also strong skin, extremely sharp claws and fangs, automatically recognizes the intention to kill, and also in terms of combat power. This gargoyle is not a bit inferior to elite warriors. Lin Jai really liked this gargoyle. He thinks that Frank is very shy, since he said that this gargoyle is not so valuable. This work is so elegant, almost realistic. Even despite the cost, it is quite a valuable token of gratitude. It seems that a gargoyle can be used for many things. For example, to exercise evil spirits, because the role of a gargoyle is close to a stone that can ward off evil. Since this is a token of Frank's appreciation, but Lin Jai will gladly accept this mundane award. The hero says that this is an extremely exquisite work of art that suits his taste perfectly. He can't wait to see what kind of gift Frank Wilder will bring him next time. Frank is very happy that Mr. Lin liked his gift. This is just one gargoyle of a frightening level. But the value of a book by such a high-ranking person as Mr. Lin is enough to create tens of millions of gargoyles. Frank is a little upset. Of course, it's good that Lin is still so good-natured and merciful, so deliberately expressed praise for the gargoyle, just so as not to offend the man. Then it's time for Frank Wilder to leave. He promises that by the next time he will definitely prepare a gift that Lin Jai will definitely be pleased with. This gift must be valuable enough to reach the divine level for sure. Lin Jai happily says goodbye to Frank. He will be looking forward to a new gift. He will also be glad to meet a man again. Then Frank Wilder leaves, and Lin Jai continues to examine the gargoyle presented to him. It is quite possible that Frank will give him a gargoyle again, so that he has both a male and a female, it will be really elegant. He is also interested in whether there are males or females among gargoyles at all. Lin Jai is not aware of this issue. In general, the gargoyle is good. A lot of energy is released from it. Restraining the force is just fine. So, Lin Jai is almost done for today. Maintaining a clear creation is really easier to attract good luck. Suddenly, the hero notices that some strange black substance is dripping onto the table from somewhere above. Lin Jai is shocked by this. Then he realizes that he is already familiar with this black liquid. They haven't seen each other for a long time. Is it really him? Chapter 4 Lin Jai is not happy to see this something in front of him. This is what is behind Lin Jai's transfer to another world. Three years later, he appeared again. Lin Jai says that since he suddenly appeared here, then it's time for the hero to pay his price. Let the black substance directly say what the hero will need to do. After all, this unknown being helped Lin Jai achieve what he wanted. He is still friendly. He must belong to the class of good gods. Shouldn't the fee for getting what you want be sky high? Then, the substance takes the form of an inscription on the table which says that DZU has already awakened and started his search. Lin Jai didn't expect this. Was it really because he had allowed Frank to recommend his book? The substance takes on a new form this time. This time in the word yes. Now the hero understands what he needs to do. We need to get other people to recommend and spread rituals and magic, whether it will be beneficial for the mysterious creature. The substance again says yes, without changing its form. Lin Jai is visibly happy about this. He says that then there are no more questions. Then Mr. Lin will do everything in his power. After these words, the black mysterious substance disappears. She abruptly disappears from Lin Jai's field of vision. He will think about what just happened for a long time. In the city of Nazan, it is still pouring heavy rain. An unknown man in a raincoat looks around the city from the balcony of a tall building. The man says out loud that it's drizzling outside. He also reports that Frank Wilder, a black faceless suspect in the Hunter's Feud, was found on 23rd Street in Nazan. It turns out that this mysterious man has been following Frank all this time. Also, the man in the raincoat reports that Frank stayed in the bookstore down the street for about an hour, which is extremely suspicious. The stalker thinks that this Lin Jai bookstore may be a secret base for dark magicians. On the other side of the conversation machine is Jack, who is now in shock from what he has just heard. He says that this intelligence is very important. Jack says that he will definitely inform teacher Joseph as soon as Jack deals with this. He also says that the man should already return and tell in more detail about what he saw there. The man replies that he understood the order and is ready to execute it. Suddenly, the very target of the pursuit appears behind the pursuer's back, Frank Wilder. He abruptly appears behind this man's back and calls him a rat. He clearly doesn't have the guts, since he has already decided on this action. The pursuer is shocked. He did not expect that his surveillance would be discovered so quickly. 
but still Frank is a very experienced magician with colossal magical power, so he easily found this person. He immediately turns back, saying Frank Wilde's name. But he moves too slowly. Frank is much faster, and he has already grabbed his pursuer by the face in the black mask. Frank tells the rat to die. At the same second, the poor man is struck by Frank's magic. He had no chance to fight back and save himself. He's dead now. Jack's voice comes from the phone of the pursuer. Jack is extremely concerned about what happened on the other end of the handset. Did something terrible really happen? But now this person will not be able to answer. Frank Wilder puts his foot on this machine, and it immediately breaks to pieces. Frank does not regret what he has just done, even if it was cruel, but having dared to look into this man's house, that is, into Lin Jai's bookstore, then let him not even think about regretting death. After the incident, Frank disappears into the night, and in the city of Nazan, the rain continues to fall without abating for a minute. The door to the intelligence office of the secret tower. Entrance to the office of the head of the department. A girl named Claude, worried and worried, knocks on the door of the office. He also enters and says that she has a report on an abnormal case for the Lord Knight. The Lord Knight allows Claude to enter. A girl with glasses says goodbye to someone in the hallway and enters the office. The Lord Knight is wondering what happened to the egg of the magic mirror. Did something happen again? Here the head of the department does not hold back and decides to speak rather rudely about the hunters. He says that hunters are really a bunch of stupid people. Claude did not expect to hear this. Apparently he came at a time when the head of the department was in a bad mood. And the Lord Knight continues his speech. If it weren't for the hunters, he would now be quietly enjoying his pension and not straining like this. He knocks with an iron hand on the table. This is a really strong blow and further says that sooner or later he will practice boxing on the tombstones of the mothers of hunters. There's a big crack in the table and Claude is about to come to his senses. She adjusts her glasses and asks the teacher to pay attention to the image she is about to show. The teacher tells Claude not to be afraid. He is also embarrassed by the fact that, it seems, Claude has not closed the door to the common corridor. Claude is a little awkward. A short silence is formed. The girl apologizes to the teacher and tells him that a new situation has formed this time. The Lord Knight clarifies, is this really a different situation? This is something new, finally. But what incident could be more important than the mess that the rabid dogs made? Claude agrees with this, but the spy who had previously tracked the hunter's movements was recently killed on 23rd Street, and according to the report that Claude brought, before he died, he found out the location of Frank Wilde. The teacher did not expect to hear something about a destructive magician. He immediately changes his face and asks again who exactly the pursuer saw. There is a joyful grin on the teacher's face. He has noticeably become excited. Claude repeats that their man was met by Frank Wilde. A black faceless magician, a magician of the destructive level, who disappeared two years ago after the Battle of the White Hills. At the moment the secret tower posted a reward for Frank's capture. Claude is really scared by this. She didn't even think about the fact that Frank really survived. These two years, only the teacher was sure that Frank Wilde survived that battle. The Lord Knight says that of course it is. He calls Frank a pathetic bedbug and also compliments his speech with the fact that no one understands his habits better than him. And finally Wilde crawled out of the sewer. The Lord Knight could not have imagined that Frank could be in Nazine. That is, right under the nose of the secret tower. It seems that his brain, wrinkled like a nut, finally squeezed out some water. Only one thing is unclear. What was Frank Wilde doing on this very 23rd street? What attracted his attention there? Claude replies that the information received by the secret tower is quite limited, since they suspect that the spy was killed by Wilde himself. At the moment only the fact that he entered a very ordinary bookstore is investigated and it is also known that he stayed. The Lord Knight is displeased. How can a dark magician who gains power by relying on language buy books? It's just impossible. Claude is shocked by such a violent reaction. The Lord Knight concludes that there is definitely something wrong with this bookstore. There is definitely some mystery in it. Have the people of the Secret Tower checked the whole background of this bookstore? Claude says that, of course, they have already checked all the available information and according to Data received. This bookstore is listed as an ash chamber of commerce. It has been operating for three years, also has a good reputation and a very small number of visitors. The only oddity of this bookstore is that the owner is a foreigner. Initially, there were suspicions that this could well be a secret base of dark magicians, but now they are not very sure about it. The Lord Knight asks, what exactly are they not sure about? Claude says they're not sure about the entire ash chamber of commerce. The ash chamber of commerce is the property of druid priests. They are light magicians who believe in nature, they are unlikely to be at one with some dark magician. Claude says that if they draw the wrong conclusions and rush, they may well damage the reputation of the Ash Chamber of Commerce. So, embittered druids can start protesting against the secret tower. The teacher is extremely dissatisfied with this state of affairs. This time, out of anger, he hits the wall in the office. He calls the druids a bunch of problematic vegetarians and continues to radiate negative energy. Claude thinks to himself that the word vegetarians is not correct, because druids are not vegetarian. 
Then the teacher turns sharply to Claude. He is sure that the girl has just thought of something indecent. The girl says it's not like that at all. She has no such thoughts. Then the Lord Knight approaches Claude with a quick step and looks at poor Claude with an angry fiery look. But the girl does not answer anything, she is just very scared. Here the teacher asks Claude to answer his unexpected question. What is the knight's task? The girl stammers and replies that the knight's main task is to eliminate darkness and preserve peace. In this case, they cannot be likened in the dark and compromise with their accomplices. So, Frank Wilde has stayed in this suspicious store for more than an hour. How could he just talk about ordinary things there, read a book or drink tea? No way. Does his dear follower Claude really think that a dark magician can just read a book in a completely ordinary bookstore? Yes, if the girl really thinks so, then the Lord Knight will put on mithril-pointed shoes and order the girl for such ignorance of such simple things. Claude then reports that the Ash Chamber of Commerce is still funding 40% of the Secret Tower's intelligence squad. Then Claude's words make sense. The teacher no longer scolds Claude, there was a very awkward silence between them. Then the Lord Knight tells the girl to forget about it and not worry. The man with the iron hand is going to personally go to this mysterious 23rd Street. He needs to see with his own eyes what, after all, is going on with this bookstore. Claude obediently agrees with this teacher. Next, he goes out into the corridor, where the Lord Knight greets the other knights of the tower. The glorious Lord Knight is asked if he has eaten. Then other knights gradually greet him. All the people in the secret tower admire their teacher. They all say that the Lord Knight is working very hard. Meanwhile, the Lord Knight descends in a fast elevator from the lowest floor of the secret tower. At the same time, he studies Lin Jai's dossier. The Lord Knight himself wants to see if this gentleman is so pure. The Lord Knight is Abraham Joseph, one of the ten glorious knights of the former secret tower. But then, in the elevator, the Lord Knight has hallucinations, they are chasing the man again. He grabs his face. His every time, at exactly this time, the curse of the magic sword of light appears in front of him. Chapter 5 The hallucinations of Lord Knight Abraham Joseph continue. He tries to get out of what his creation has plunged a man into, but he can't stop his visions. Now it seems to him that he is drowning in an infinitely deep sea. Long tentacles pull him down to the very bottom of the sea. These tentacles have eyes and mouths. The man still can't resist it in any way. Here, some unknown elf grabs the Lord Knight and covers his mouth with his hand. Then Abraham Joseph plunges down alone. He is being pulled deeper and deeper further and further. But then the hallucination stops abruptly. The man with the iron hand is very glad that this is finally over, and he has returned to reality. Now he is on the street and leans on some building here. It's still raining and nauseating on 23rd Street, and the weather doesn't promise to be better, at least cloudless. Lord Knight Abraham Joseph feels that he will not be able to go to that bookstore today. It's really some kind of curse. The Sword of Light is the madness of its first owner and also his imminent demise enclosed a curse in the sword, driving subsequent owners crazy. But only a strong-minded knight with unshakable willpower will be able to subdue this sword of light and curb its curse. But Abraham Joseph did not expect that the reverse effect would come so quickly and he would not have time to find a worthy successor, so he is forced to suffer from constant hallucinations. Right now, the great and invincible knight of the sacred flame is no more than just an elderly cripple right now. The man is a little offended because of this. The first leader of the organization White Wolf Harris says that the sudden activity really surprises him. It seems that he underestimated that lady, she is not as useless as it might initially seem. She will even be able to get the role of a second leader, for example. It's worth looking at what her subordinates will be able to do when faced with this. Kaji, now the former leader of the organization White Wolf Jai Jixiu is fighting with the next enemies. They call the girl a monster and attack her from behind. The girl quickly deals with them. Next, she asks her friend Max how things are going. He says it has been confirmed that Harris has the enchanted face now. He must have gone completely crazy, since he staged a massacre inside the hunter's organization right after he took possession of the egg. Jai Jixu is very angry. He thinks that Harris has really gone crazy. Max also says that he is afraid that their people are not strong enough to fight Harris yet. He's already teamed up with his third leader, Kaji, and it's possible that this attack could end in death. Then Kate appears, she also has an opinion on this matter. She says that Harris has a powerful force. Among the White Wolves he is closest to the frightening level, but Kaji has trained many hunters of the organization. She is also afraid that the two have specifically teamed up against Jai Jixinu. Kate is sorry that Milady is faced with the betrayal of a vile person who is looking for the person behind her. Jai Jixiu thanks Kate for such words. If Kate hadn't changed clothes with the girl then, and hadn't helped her to restrain her pursuers, she would never have come out of that siege. Now Jai Jixiu is standing in front of Kate, struggling with the obstacles of fate, and all thanks to Kate herself. Kate thinks Milady is really amazing. She doesn't know what happened to her. Because when she returned, she was unexpectedly able to suppress the effects of tainted blood and even preserve her sanity, without even having to turn into a beast. This is literally beyond the understanding of hunters. And that white figure traveling through time and space, tracking and killing enemies. Just like. Then another person appears. He ends the phrase Kate himself, the girl wanted to say, just like God. 
The man also says that although Harris is very strong, the fact that he is just close to a frightening level makes him really intimidating. And once the beast transforms, both Harris and Kaji become extremely easy targets. This man is an employee of the organization White Wolf, Mouse Ryan. Everyone is annoyed by Ryan. But Jai Jixiu believes that it seems that every organization has such a crazy person as a mouse. The rune of loyalty is imprinted on the soul, at least you can trust this guy. Jai Jixiu thinks that Kate and Max will be able to resist the power of destroying the egg of the magic mirror thanks to the rune of the light magician, who is under the patronage of the family. Then Jai Jixiu says out loud that she has the tainted blood of the beast. This is the hunt for the ferocious beast of dreams has already become conscious. Now the hunters have no way back. You need to move only forward, straight to your goal. Max, Kate and Mouse Ryan are worried about the midsection. They ask her to be careful. The heroes are enthusiastically heading for the decisive battle. The heroes are at the entrance to the church. With a deft movement of the sword, Jai Jixiu destroys this entrance, and they move forward. The third head of the White Wolf organization, Kaji, was waiting for them in the church all this time. Kate doesn't understand why Kaji is here alone. Where is Harris? Then Jai Jixiu pushes Kate back. It seems to her that something is wrong here. She grabs Kaji and realizes that something was done to him earlier. Jai Jixiu wants to help Kaji to find out at least some information before it's too late. Then she asks Max for an injection before he turns into a beast. Jai Jixiu injects Kazdi and asks him where Harris is. Did he leave after taking the magic mirror egg? Kaji says he's coming soon. By he there is the word God. Then the third chapter dies, without really having time to tell anything. My lady is extremely upset because everything is going completely wrong according to plan. Max says that they should go to Haywood and ask him. Because he, as a magician who was obliged to the family, will not refuse to help them. Jai Jixiu says it's not necessary. She also asks Kate to continue searching for Harris with Max. But Ryan should go with Jai Jixiu. The man asks where they are going. Then Jai Jixiu says that they need to go to 23rd Street. Chapter 6 Lin Jai is sitting at a table in a bookstore. He is carelessly sipping tea and reading another book. It seems that another idle day is waiting for him. It has been three whole days since Lin Jai was visited by Frank Wilder and Miss Jai Jixiu. And from that moment on, no one looked at Lin Jai. Mr. Lin continues to drink his tea. He also thinks that even though he barely has enough money for food right now, Lin Jai still owes a lot to that little black girl, that is, Miss Jixiu. Lin Jai is simply obliged to show gratitude for the financing of his bookstore, an official business license and a temporary residence permit that Jai Jixiu presented to Mr. Lin and his beloved bookstore. He really hopes that the book Nonviolent Communication, which Lin Jai had previously recommended to the girl, can really help her. After all, such unpleasant moments at school are simply terrible, but in such weather, there must be no visitors again. Lin Jai needs to think about how he can recommend the book he wrote. Accidents like the one that happened to Miss Jai are quite rare. After all, someone comes into the bookstore here. Lin Jai did not hope for customers at all today. He immediately greets the guest and does not believe his eyes. Jai Jixiu herself came to him. She comes in and immediately closes the doors of the store with herself. The girl immediately apologizes for the concern provided to Mr. Lin. Lin Jai doesn't know at all how to react to this. His expression expresses a complete misunderstanding of the situation right now. He decides to somehow react to the girl so that she does not feel uncomfortable. He says he is very happy to see Miss Jai Jixiu. But Lin Jai was just talking about his regular customers and now, the girl came here right away. Is his book business finally gaining momentum? It is quite possible that this lady will bring Lin Jai good luck, profit and prosperity, and it is for this that it is worth investing in your studies. Lin Jai continues the conversation with the girl. He says that he did not expect to meet the girl again just three days after their last meeting. He also adds that customers do not return to his boring and boring bookstore after such a short time. The girl is the first in this, she really surprises. Jai Jixiu thinks that, apparently, Mr. Lin is very disappointed with her. After all, it is obvious that since Jai Jixiu had already received such good advice and guidance three days earlier, she definitely should have solved all the problems instantly. But now, halfway through, she again came to the bookstore for help. She is ashamed to admit that she did not cope with the problems herself. She needs one more additional help. That's when everything will work out. Jai Jixiu continues to groundlessly blame herself. Is she really the most useless of Mr. Lin Jai's visitors? The girl really, really does not like her situation. She is really upset. Then Jai Jixiu looks up and notices a gargoyle on Lin Jai's word. Isn't this the same gargoyle that magicians use? Even without a magical aura, she is very intimidating to the girl. Mr. Lin must have discovered her while hiding, just like an ordinary person. But would that calm Jai Jixiu down? Unfortunately for her, she is very weak, like a defenseless child. Will Mr. Lin, as always, treat the girl with tolerance and even encouragement? Immediately after these thoughts, Jai Jixiu berates himself for them. What kind of brazen thoughts are in her head? The girl apologizes for taking and upsetting Lin Jai. Then Mouse Ryan abruptly enters the store. He asks if this is really the place Jai Jixiu was going to take him to. 
But this is an ordinary bookstore, what's the point? Or to this unusual store, then it changes the case. Here he sees Lin Jai, who is an ordinary person. Then Mouse Ryan does not understand anything at all. Lin Jai wonders what kind of person he is. The lady says that this is her subordinate. His loyalty is 100% absolute, do not worry about it. Lin Jai is unhappy with this man. He feels sorry for the girl in his own way, because this poor child is actually surrounded by some scoundrels. Ryan's mouse apparently should have a loyalty mark. Then Lin Jai notices something strange. After all, if Jai Zixiu had already taken revenge on that terrible person, as Mr. Lin advised earlier, then the girl would not be so confused and insecure now. Besides, how could she upset the hero, as she said earlier? Had Ling Jai's worst suspicions been confirmed? Then he asks Miss directly if she has failed in her revenge. Jai Jixiu is not at all surprised that Mr. Lin already knows everything. She honestly admits that yes, she completely failed. This man ran away from her, and her people still don't know where. She has already sent someone to look for this man, but there are still no leads yet. Jai Jixiu's fight with him lasted two days. And she made so much progress, thanks to Lin Jai's leadership, that Harris was already steadily retreating. But yesterday, after five hours of fierce fighting, despite the great expense, Miss Jai was able to destroy his headquarters. Yet by that time Jai Jixiu realized that Harris already knew that her opponent was not himself. So after abandoning his ally, he ran away, and now it seems to the girl that she underestimated the enemy. And the fact that everything was going smoothly was just an unusual warning. Lin Jai is very surprised by this story. Jai Jixiu apologizes to Mr. Lin because the girl got carried away so quickly. Lin Jai says that she shouldn't apologize, it's not a girl's mistake. Then the hero sips his tea. He doesn't fully understand what happened. And really, what's wrong? How did this lovely lady turn human relations into a war? Although, to be fair, everyone says that love is like a battlefield. Only in this case, love is the battlefield. Ling Jai keeps thinking about it. It is possible that this miss is used to using some business terms, which is why her descriptions have become so suspicious and strange. It will be easier to explain it this way, apparently. What Jai Lin meant was that she had been communicating with that bad man for three days, but in the end the lady realized that this cunning man had already found a good way to escape from the girl. After all, he had prepared in advance. That is, that he left a friend as bait and disappeared with the money stolen from Jai Jiusu. So that's it. Lin Jai says he understood everything. Then the girl is very interested in what Mr. Lin thinks about all this. That's where Mouse Ryan got completely confused. Who is this person for miss? What's going on here anyway? Earlier. It turned out that the mouse reports information to the other side. He called his customer and told him what he had found out. He found out that the black faceless is now in the city. The person on the other side of the connection is surprised that Ryan found out about such top secret information. Ryan asks if he really doubts the reliability of his information. The voice on the phone says, of course not. As expected from Mr. Ryan, he easily did what they could not. It's so exciting that the blood runs cold. Ryan says there's no need to flatter him. His next target will be one girl. Ryan should take the loyalty mark as insurance, but the person does not know if it will be easy to reduce it later. However, the power that this girl possesses is quite interesting. Then Kate appears, which prevents this conversation from continuing. She finally found the place where the mouse was hiding. She says Jai Jixiu is looking for him everywhere, it's time to go. Now Ryan is my lady's servant, not a wild mouse running around on the floor. He could definitely use some manners. Ryan immediately apologizes for his mistake, he will come right away. He's sorry he kept Miss waiting. Ryan has the ability to freely control the ability to transform, and if he manages to get hold of this dangerous information, they will be able to destroy all the organizations of hunters. And after receiving them, even a sewer mouse can become the king of beasts. Right now, Ryan doesn't need to disappoint Miss Jai Jixiu, but he still does not understand why Medeli treats an ordinary person so respectfully, as if she had encountered the strongest divine level. The lady asks Lin Jai to help her urgently. Mr. Lin says that she doesn't need to worry so much. Everything is easier than the girl thinks. After all, Jai Jixiu's enemy is not that person right now, but something else. A girl's fear is just fear, so she needs to wait, then there will definitely be good news. Here Ryan understands something. Because he is also engaged in deceiving people, then he is well familiar with cunning techniques. And is Mr. Lin using something like that? Bragging, empty words, ambiguity all these are tricks used by scammers, Ryan knows all too well about it. Lin Jai is a complete liar. Here Mr. Lin apologizes and asks to wait a little. The hero needs to sort something out, it will take literally five minutes. Lin Jai thought that there would be no guests today, so he himself drank too much tea, he needed to pour more. Lin Jai leaves, and then Ryan starts asking the boss about all this. Jai Jixiu calls Ryan an impudent person, she took the mouse with her, only because the information that the man owns can be useful, and not because she trusts him or appreciates him. Doesn't he know that he has to be polite? Ryan doesn't have any manners. Ryan screams that Lin Jai is a complete liar. Yes, the mouse does not know about manners, but he knows it. Knows too well. 
There is no one who knows better than him. Although Mr. Lin is good at lying. But Ryan can find at least three people who do it on the same level as him. Ryan just doesn't want to see Miss cheating again. Jai Jixiu says she shouldn't have taken Ryan with her. But if the mouse was not useful, then the girl would certainly cut him down with a sword right now. Then Ryan calms down a little. He thinks this little girl is really easy to manipulate. You just need to distract her attention from Ryan with the help of blind faith in Jai. Ryan says he will prove everything to the girl as soon as Lin Jai returns. He hides a sharp blade in his sleeve, apparently prepared it for Lin Jai. Immediately, a gargoyle awakens, who felt a thirst for murder. Ryan was going to hurt Mr. Lin. Then the gargoyle grabs Ryan and almost swallows him. Jai Jixiu doesn't even have time to do anything, and she herself is very scared of what just happened. Then Lin Jai comes down from the top floor, he apologizes for keeping him waiting. Then Mr. Lin notices that the lady's subordinate is nowhere to be found. Where is he? The girl does not know what to answer, she is still scared. Then she decides to lie to Lin Jai, saying that Ryan had an urgent matter, so he left. 